uh, uh, hearing about use of Indigenous knowledge in work planning. So to kick us off, we're going to hear about the 2023 integrated delivery schedule and expectations for CERT progress. And this is with Tabitha Elkington of the Corps and Mindy Parrott. I think Tabitha is joining us remotely. Just before we kind of dive into the, some of the questions that are outlined on the agenda, we'll go ahead and do a couple, just mention a couple quick introductory things about the IDS itself. So if you could go to the next slide, Mindy. All right, great. Um, so today we're going to be providing an overview of the 2023 Integrated Delivery Schedule, or IDS. We'll mainly focus our presentation around the questions that are kind of outlined on that agenda. But just a couple opening notes about the IDS itself or integrated delivery schedule and what this document is and what it's used for. So it's an optimized schedule and sequencing strategy for planning, design and construction that's based on engineering and science. It's also a pretty significant communications tool for our program that kind of helps both the program um, across the program and members of the public kind of understand where we've headed in the last, or where we've been in the last couple of years, where we're going out into the future. And it kind of brings predictability to project budgeting and decision-making by having that kind of laid out in the IDS. It also serves the purpose of the master sequencing and implementation plan that's described in the original CERT plan or the yellow book. So it fills that function um, that was originally in, envisioned in the yellow book. And it's also updated annually. So this is a document we refresh every year in partnership with the Water Management District, which is why Mindy and I are presenting together today. We work on this updating this document jointly. Um, and it's updated through a public process in consultation with the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force and its working group. Um, so next I'm gonna kind of tackle, we're taking some of the questions out of sequence here. But next I'm going to cover how prior IDS budget estimates have compared with actual budgets and implications for progress. And part of kind of getting to that explanation or a bit of it, I'll kind of step through what some of these budget numbers mean that you see on that front page of the IDS. So there are two tables I'm gonna be talking through in particular, one at kind of the top um, right, and then another that's kind of right above the top of all of the project schedules on this front page. So the front page of the IDS shows investments in the SURFER program through 2022. That's that first table on the upper right-hand side. Um, it kind of breaks down the funds spent to date as of 2022. So you can see in black, we've got federal investments from the core and DOI. And then we also have non-federal investments from the state of Florida. And kind of as you can see, we've got the breakdown of kind of some pre-SERP pieces and then also things that are um, CNSF SERP projects. And total South Florida ecosystem restoration funding to date is just over $8 billion. And then you can also see below there investments to date in Herbert Hoover Dyke and restoration strategies and ECP. And then if you go to the next slide, so this you'll see kind of this is the bar that appears at the top of the project schedules on page one. And I'm going to take a minute to kind of break down what these numbers are and kind of where they've come from and highlight a couple changes in recent years about how we approach building these numbers that are included in the IDS. So um, just kind of starting off, FY22 and FY23 show funds that were actually received. So that's the, those are kind of known amounts that were received in, and those were our budgets. FY24 reflects the president's budget and the governor's budget. And FY25 and beyond are projections based on the optimized schedule in the IDS. So if you were to go to look at back years of the IDS, that's kind of how we've done that breakdown is the first couple of years are what we know we've received recently. The next year is, uh, and then from that year out are kind of projections based on that optimized schedule after we've got the kind of what we anticipate from the president's budget and governor's budget. Um, so this, the IDS itself, as I mentioned, is kind of an optimized schedule and these funds this year, one of the changes we made this year is 
Um, we assume that we'll get full funding in the year of a construction contract award. That's kind of shifted the numbers a bit compared to last year. Um, and we kind of wanted to illustrate what that looks like given that currently we only have incremental funding, which would allow us to award a contract and then have funds for that in kind of out years versus needing to have all of the funds in the year a contract is awarded. So kind of an example of this is in FY24, that kind of represents the award of a large construction contract for the EAA reservoir that is incrementally funded. So those dollars for that construction contract will are kind of distributed across the years of construction. And then it also represents the acceleration of three large construction part contracts that are funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law. And those contracts were fully funded for full construction in FY24. So rather than distributing the cost across the years of construction, we're fully accounting for those bill contracts in FY24. So hopefully that kind of explains one piece of how those out years look and why. And also just to note, um, we starting in 2019 kind of shifted the way we come up with those out year projections before they were kind of um, constrained and a bit more averaged across the years. And then in 2019, we made the decision to kind of show it reflected based on that optimized schedule and what the engineering said you could do. So there's been some ways we've kind of changed in the last year in terms of showing an assumption that we would not have incremental funding except for the one piece we have authorization for incremental funding. So that's one change that was made this year. And then in 2019, we had kind of shifted the way we projected those out years to kind of reflect the optimized schedule included in the IDS itself. So hopefully that's not too confusing, but just trying to explain how we get those projected numbers past the numbers that are either known or based on those estimated figures in the president's budget and governor's budget respectively for the state and federal budgets. A couple other things to note when you look at these top line numbers, but this really represents we've had kind of unprecedented amounts of funding for the last few years that have helped increase um, kind of accelerate program implementation. We had a billion dollars from the bipartisan infrastructure law. We've had unprecedented amounts of funding in addition to that from both the federal and state side for the last few years. So that's also a shift if you were to go back and look at, at some of the kind of further back IDSs and their top line budget estimates. Um, but of course, once you get those projections, those are just projections and what our actual budgets are, are dependent on either the state legislature or Congress. So just kind of noting that's kind of an obvious piece here, but in terms of going back and comparing those projections to what money we actually get, there's, you know, a couple changes I mentioned in terms of how we calculate those out years. And then, of course, knowing that the final budget numbers is just going to be dependent on what we get from the state legislature and from Congress. Next, um, oh, and sorry, this just shows the breakdown for FY25 showing what the um, president's budget was for construction, what the governor's budget, recommended budget was, um, and then showing that one, the billion dollars under construction for the bipartisan infrastructure law. So that's the actual breakdown for FY25 between those different pieces that went into that top line number. All right, so next we're gonna move on to the next question around project schedules and like kind of looking at the large scale view of where restoration is headed and I'll hand it over to Mindy for this piece. Yeah, so as you can see if you put the IDS on a slide there, you can't see anything. So that's why I brought you a handout so you can take a look at it with me. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like the sausage making of the IDS and what affects schedules and what, what we're doing when we're updating it every year. Um, and as Tabitha said, we update it every year. It's a month's project process that we go through to make sure we have all the information correct that, we, that goes into the IDS, although it is a snapshot in time, right? So this is based on the information we have in fall of this year. Um, things change, right? Schedules change all the time. And why do schedules change? There's a number of reasons why things might change. 
Um, and some of them have to do with policy and budgets and others just have to do with the projects themselves, right? So, you know, funding might be available. Right now, funding, lots of funding is available. So we are putting as many projects in design and construction as we can. And that's reflected on the IDS for 2023. Um, there's over 10 projects between the district and the core that are scheduled to um, start construction in FY24 and, 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 for, and several more in 25. Um, also, um, sometimes funding isn't available. We've seen it, that in previous years where things have had to be shelved. Um, so that's something that can change the schedule. Cost share balance. Another something that's not on the IDS is the cost share balance between the district and the core. So that's one thing that we have to consider when we're thinking about who's doing what, because um, the district and the core have a programmatic cost share agreement for CERT projects. And some of these are not CERT projects, but most of them are. Um, and the CERT projects, we, the, the state, need to say just a little bit ahead of the 50-50 with the core to keep everything on track. And so we do look at that. And if, if we have to make a shift um, like we did this past year, um, the district took on a couple more projects that the core was originally going to build. And that's reflected in here. Um, a couple of examples are the Indian River Lagoon South South Res Reservoir for the C2324 area. Um, that was originally going to be constructed by the Corps, but because we have the funding and we have the ability, we are putting that one out, out further, bringing it forward. And it also helps us on our cost share because it is um, an over 50,000 acre foot reservoir. So um, that's another example. We also have to think about um, things like what the PIR say about sequencing, which pieces have to be in place before others, operational planning. We think about that because operational planning and, and Tabitha will talk about that on, on another slide. Um, we have to have the operational plans in place when the features are done constructing so that we can operate them to achieve the benefits of the project. And then, you know, things happen, right? Um, planning processes get extended, like, like in Losum, right? Um, you know, we might have a change to a TSP that might, you know, things might take longer than we expect or construction might take longer or any number of things could take longer than we expect. Um, we might come up with a better design for a feature and then we have to maybe document that through a NEPA process or a design documentation process. And all those things are um, affecting schedules in some way. And then, you know, we have projects that are in the central Everglades in public lands. And then we have projects that are um, in Miami-Dade County or in Martin and St. Lucie counties where we have, have to build the projects in and around um, where people live and work, right? And there's all sorts of complications when you have those kind of projects because we have to have you know, utility relocations and agreements with landowners and agreements with counties. And there's a whole lot of other work behind the scenes that has to happen before we build those. Um, so that's what um, some of the things that go into making the schedule. And so if you took this schedule and you looked at last year's schedule next to it, you could see that something shifted, um, but we are doing everything we can to keep everything on track and, and ongoing. And, you know, we also last year started uh, low car, which you'll hear about in a little bit. And that will, uh, that was added to the bottom of the schedule this year. So that's new. And if it's authorized um, and it goes into design, then it will be added. I don't know how <laughs> we're running out of space, but it will be added to the um, schedule and we will see how that uh, plays out and what its schedule will be. So, um, you know, 
part of the reason we update it every year is because of all the different things that can affect how those schedules work. So with that, I will let's see what the next slide is. I will toss it back over to Tabitha for a uh, discussion of the page two. Thanks, Minnie. And then um, do you want to also make sure you hit on the couple of things that will be operating within the next few years? I can take that too. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we wanted to also mention, you know, one of the questions was, you know, what, what are we looking forward to having completed and operated in a big picture in, in the next two years? And, um, well, we have the SEP um, new water seepage barrier wall that will be done in a, it's mostly done. It'll be done very, very soon. Um, we are very close to completing within the next two years, a picky and strand restoration project and also Biscayne Bay coastal wetlands. And so um, as those projects complete, their operate, operating manuals are being updated. They'll go into what we call the operation testing and monitoring period. And um, as you know, we work very hard to make sure that once we have something built, that we're able to operate in some capacity so it's giving us benefits until the rest of the project is ready. So. Um, those are some of the major ones that um, will be done in the next two years. And as I said, we've got, you know, many more projects starting construction very soon. Yeah. All right, thanks, Mindy. So with that, I'll kind of jump in and wrap up with the last couple questions. Um, the first is discuss, discuss contingencies for SERP and SEP progress so the committee can understand ripple effects if delays occur. Um, so kind of as we mentioned, we're at least updating the IDS on an annual basis to kind of reflect what's possible in terms of the engineering and accounting for any shifts in schedule, either opportunities to move things forward or where things may slow down, accounting for any changes in budgets compared to what we might have anticipated, and kind of using that to help guide our work. Um, but just in terms of the big picture, there's an urgent need for this work. Um, if delays occur, we can expect to see the same types of ecological damage that we've seen in recent years and in the past in terms of kind of continuing to put strain on a system that can sometimes have too much or not enough water in different locations. So you could see the types of ecological impacts we're familiar with, like tree islands being impacted by water, causing erosion or vegetation change. Um, seeing, you know, Lake Okeechobee impacted by high water levels and not having enough support submerged aquatic vegetation to support the fisheries and other parts of that ecosystem, seeing extreme fires in the western Everglades if soils continue to be too dry, or seeing land loss in the coastal fringes if they're kind of not able to keep up with the pace of sea level rise. So we can expect to see those types of ecological impacts but what we're doing um, kind of the best we can with at the moment is using operational flexibility and operations when we have water to send places we need it to kind of work with the existing system. And then also kind of as we are building these projects, do increment or do operational planning. So we're ready to operate pieces as they're completed and they can come online and be integrated into the system and provide additional capacity and flexibility. So we're kind of Moving, is for, moving forward as much as we can with the funds and authorizations that we have at the time, and then trying to make sure that as we get those pieces completed, we're able to use them and have that extra flexibility in the system to either store more water or move at different places, depending on what's completed. Um, and also just kind of a note that like this, the plan, the Yellow Book plan and SERP as we're kind of implementing it, these restoration projects are designed to be interconnected. You know, you need to reduce seepage into urban areas to be able to raise water levels in the central Everglades. You need to decompartmentalize the central Everglades so you can flow water across it. You need to raise the Tamiami Trail, um, also as part of making sure that water can flow south, making sure that water is clean that's flowing around the system, having storage so you can store water when it's not needed, provide it when it is needed, 
having the storage both kind of north and south of Lake Okeechobee to have water to flow south and east and west to try and avoid damaging discharges to the Everglades. So all of these pieces will kind of provide the largest benefits once they're all complete and can work in concert. But until then, we're trying to take advantage of incremental improvements to kind of reduce the severity of those types of ecological damaging events that I mentioned at the beginning um, where we can. So also just to note a couple key dependencies in terms of the sequencing of projects. Um, for example, the C-111 impoundment portion of Broward County water preserve areas needs to be in place before SEP South benefits can be fully realized. Um, that dependency is noted in the SEP chief's report. Southern portions of SEP also have to be built before the EA reservoir north of there can provide the water it's storing south towards the Everglades or towards Everglades National Park. Um, SEP new water will provide seepage management that will help support that increased water flow through towards Everglades National Park. And the Tamiami Trail next steps is important to again, get that water flow moving. So those are just a couple pieces that are connected to each other that are important. So with that, I'll move on to the last question and kind of wrap up. So we hopefully have some time for questions. Um, the last question is discuss what's left that's not scheduled on the IDS um, and kind of talk a bit about that and what's, what's already underway and what's to come. So just kind of noting as we move through these slides, this shows the operational planning schedule. And then this I'll focus on, um, yeah, so if you are interested in the sequencing of operational planning and how it matches up with those project schedules on the front, you can look at this table, which is on page two, and see how we're moving different pieces of operational planning forward so that when those things are constructed, we're ready to start using them and implementing them into overall operations. Um, so next slide. Now I'll kind of focus on, if you look at page two on the back page, kind of the right-hand side, you'll see this large map. And this has a breakdown of all of the original yellow book components and shows their status. So this gives you a really quick snapshot of how much is kind of underway and in what phase and how much is left to consider. So right now we've got 32% of yellow book components are either completed or phase one implemented. 18% are either in authorized design and construction phase, 8% are in planning and feasibility phase, and 26% are pending. 4% have been deauthorized, but that 26% is kind of that piece of the pie that remains for consideration whether or not it's feasible and if we want to move it forward. So um, that's just kind of a quick high-level snapshot of kind of how much is left to do. But I also wanted to highlight that a big chunk of those pending projects will be taken up for consideration in the next planning study we have queued up, which will be Southern Everglades. And you can see the time frame for that on page one at the bottom of the IDS. It shows our planning studies, both ongoing efforts that are already underway, like Western Everglades and BBC Air, but then also Southern Everglades, which is kind of the next in the queue that we'd like to pick up and look at. So of the remaining components, you can see that we've got an awful lot of them included in Southern Everglades. This is going to be a large study area. WERP and SEP are kind of the two other largest chunks, but Southern Everglades also has a large potential Southern or study area and picks up a lot of these remaining pieces. And we decided to move Southern Everglades forward as the next potential study, kind of largely informed by the work that Recover is doing. And that Re Recover report card showed that the part of the system that was in kind of the poorest health was the Southern part of the system. So that was kind of the impetus to look at this and look at what components we might wanna consider next. So I will note that these are just the possible components that may be included in that study, but these are kind of likely what we will look at when we take it up. And once, that's, once we've moved that forward, you know, that remaining 26% will shrink pretty significantly. And, you know, we kind of take things up in these planning studies as we go along, but just noting that like, really the bulk of these components will be evaluated or have already been evaluated and even more will be, have, have been evaluated for feasibility after the Southern Everglades study. Um, so in terms of that, what else remains? I think 
kind of getting to the magnitude question, if you look at the yellow book and kind of some of the original estimates for water storage for Everglades restoration, a big chunk of that would have been accomplished through ASR. We've had a bit of a delay in terms of implementing ASR and have some kind of ongoing scientific investigations that we'll talk about a little more this afternoon. But that's kind of one piece to think about where the original magnitude, you know, like as we've implemented that, we've had to make some adjustments and take a little more time to evaluate things as we've kind of gotten to beyond feasibility and looking at implementation. So with that, I can wrap up from there and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Questions from the committee? down so yeah there we go how's that better better sorry okay. um what we also heard yesterday is that the bounty of the the bill money the bipartisan infrastructure law money was not necessarily evenly spread across some of the other agencies and entities who have to permit the construction or study some of the study work and i'm specifically referencing fish and wildlife service esa um, park service coordination tribal coordination perhaps even some state coordination that's necessary my question is is there has i know you guys are under a lot of pressure now to spend the money and get these projects going and rightfully so um how how are you how are you handling this increase in the permitting requirements because it does impact your time of getting these things in place don't turn it off I think in well, terms of, oh, go ahead. Well, from the, from our two agency side, we work very closely with the state and federal agencies and we try to be very upfront with the schedules and, and coordination for those projects. Um, from the funding side, you know, I can't, I don't really have, have the ability to answer that question, um, but we do try to work through, um, you know, programmatic permitting things if they're available. Um, we also have to consider the, the tribes review in that process and the time that they need. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it can, it can be difficult for, for them to keep up with us, but hopefully that message will be heard in Washington and funding will begin to flow that direction. Uh, so you need some more money. Thank you. <laughs> what well, else direct to those agencies specifically, right? Like we can't send the money elsewhere, right? And I would just also add, you know, having the IDS itself for, you know, like obviously we're not responsible for other agencies budgeting priorities that are completing some of those additional reviews. Um, but they could at least have the IDS as a tool showing here's what we have teed up. Here's where we know we're going to have work. You know, like that could be something they could use and consider in, in their budget requests. But I think that's a question that's better for someone at DOI who's involved in the budgeting process to answer for the, you know, Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act pieces or ESA consultation. You know, I think you'd have to ask the agencies responsible for some of those other permitting permits and reviews to kind of talk about their budget implications. Thank you. So I have a question about the cost share issue. So I know this was a big issue eight, 10 years ago, and then it resolved through some project partnership agreements. So sometimes it's not how much money the state has spent, but it's how much is tied up in plan that hasn't gotten a sign off on it. 
but I'm looking at budgets ahead, seeing this BIL money, and it sounds like you're already at a level of concern. And I'm wondering how the, how you anticipate cost share to affect the ability to keep spending large federal dollars in the years ahead. Um, well, so in the past, right, the um, the the state was ahead of the core, the fed, federal yeah. side um, in terms of cost share. And that was largely because um, the state went out and bought a lot of real estate that was needed for, for the projects that were, you know, foreseen. So um, eventually with these large slugs of funds coming from the, for the federal side, the BIL, um, I think the Inflation Reduction Act also, or is that the same one? I don't remember. There were two of them, <laughs> sent a lot of money toward um, the federal side. And so when we started to look at that, and that's something that we have spreadsheets for, and we look at closely between us, like how, um, how it might play out in the future. Um, you know, we look at the IDS, um, it, it represents unrestrained funding to get the schedule, right? But we all know we don't necessarily get unrestrained funding. So that's part of the adjustment every year as we look at what do we have, what resources do we have to work with? And, and then the priorities might come to bear at that point between leadership. So um, so, so in looking out, yeah, are you, would you say the 22, 23 which are actually budgeted are the ones mm -hmm. that are super reliable and 24 and beyond are what you would hope for, but you might have these cost crediting things that may impact or, or in the near term, like 2024, is that a number that takes, you said that was based on request. So 2024 is our, um, reflects the construction of, um, the schedule that's shown. But we, the slide, um, we do have the actual 2024 budgets. And that's why we have the slide in here is because we didn't um, report it that way on the IDS this year, but it is the actuals, right? So up and through this fiscal year, which is FY24, we have the actual amount of money that were budgeted for both sides. And beyond that, it is what we need to accomplish the schedule based on the constraints of, you know, how projects have to be funded. And a couple of quick pieces to add to the cost share balance question too. I think continuing to move forward those agreements for cost share crediting for projects is important. We just signed a new cost share, uh, or a pre-partnership credit agreement that allows the state to move forward with potentially some pieces of work. We're trying to, um, there are some pieces of projects that the state was able to take on and start doing construction on that previously the core had planned to do construction. So I think we are constantly kind of evaluating where there's flexibility to manage that cost share balance and keep things kind of balanced and on the right side of the ledger um, for the state. So then you're, you're not, concerned at this point that cost share credit like you have enough tools in the toolbox to manage that because this is where it gets frustrating like sometimes the state's in the lead sometimes the feds are in the lead but you can never let the feds be in the lead of one dollar more than 50 percent total credit <laughs> and so which is sometimes procedurally challenging even if you know because because as you know, money doesn't come evenly. But but are you feeling confident that you have enough tools or is that a concern in the years ahead? Well, I think we're pretty confident for the next few years. Yeah. And hopefully Tabitha agrees. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think we're like, as part of this annual update of the IDS, we update that cost share analysis as well. And we look kind of for a balance, I think it's five years out. So kind of making sure within a certain average, we're doing okay. And when we do that analysis, we can kind of look for places to tweak things and make sure the state is staying a little bit ahead of us. So I think for, for the last round of analysis we did for the next few years, we, we feel confident that we're in a good place. 
But, you know, for those projections in the out years, it really just depends on, on the funding we receive and then how we have to kind of manage things from there. But again, I think it's something we do in partnership and, and strategically plan together to make sure we're, we're able to work as a team to move things forward as quickly as possible with the resources we have. Any more questions for Mindy and Tabitha? Okay, thank you both. So next we're moving on. Um, we'll hear from Zula May Vega Liriano and she's going to focus on progress and plans for storage north of Lake Okeechobee. And this will cover Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, Aquifer Storage and Recovery, and Lake Okeechobee Component A Reservoir. And, and committee members, uh, I'm sorry I didn't, I forgot to have, give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So when you ask questions, um, please take that opportunity to do that yourselves. Thank you. And while Zoomet is getting set up, I just want to remind people there's a sign up for public comment. We have public comment at 2.30. So if you can sign up by 2.15 outside on the front table. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is, good afternoon, everyone, uh, State River Committee and participants. My name is Sulamed Vega Liriano, and I'm the current chief of the watershed planning section uh, in uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and what we do is really to focus on studies in South Florida that are focusing on inland problems. Uh, this is within the aquatic ecosystem restoration uh, uh, purview and also inland uh, flood risk management. Sure. No problem. So today I will present to you the agenda topic uh, for this section, which is um, information to address some of the concerns on the topics that are in the SIPSERP agenda about the North Lake Okashobi. Uh, specifically, I, I will disclose it within uh, that paragraph uh, in three parts. Uh, so the first question uh, to describe the rationale for needing uh, to make additional major changes to the third draft low uh, PIR EIS. And we will be focusing on that information in slide five for reference. Um, there's also in that same uh, bullet, uh, please provide an update on the state of the latest uh, proposed plan of LOPE and how those features will contribute to the regional project objectives and affects the lake storage conditions for uh, Lake Okeechobee and the hydrologic conditions, timing and flow volumes for the northern estuaries and south of the lake. That information will be presented in slide number six. And what is the vision uh, for ASR within the project footprint uh, that will be covered in slide five more as a talking point. And I will do my best to highlight uh, the answers to these questions. On this slide, uh, to really to introduce the topic, I know that the Northern Lake um, Okeechobee um, is listed in the CISREP agenda with uh, three kind of components. So I want to talk a, a little bit about that. Um, in LOPE, when we started in 2016, we started with above ground storage. We started with wetland restoration, and we also started with uh, aquifer recover uh, uh, ASR wells, right? Um, 
And although the above ground storage was removed from Lobe, um, South Florida and um, uh, the core are still uh, working on authorizing the same features, but pursued under different mechanisms. And in this slide, I'm trying to present the different mechanisms. Uh, so it's, it's clear for everyone. So it's really uh, split between low car and low. Um, the first being uh, state funding and under the section 203, uh, and that's low car. Uh, which right now uh, is targeting a ward of 2024, um, and it will be completed by the state, um, and it's really focused on above ground only. Then on the second one, uh, we have the low component, which is cost shared. Um, and in, in this particular effort, we're focusing on, on, on kind of wetland only. Uh, and it's targeting on 2024. Um, and this effort will be completed by South Florida Water Management District and USACE or the core. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really focused on the wetland component. And also as part of work, we have this cost share piece, which is the ASRs, uh, which uh, there's no uh, targeted water right now. Um, and I will explain why through my presentation. Um, and again, it will be completed by both agencies. Um, and as I mentioned, it's focused on ASR. So I just want to point out that my presentation today will be focused on the uh, last two efforts, uh, which are the wetland restoration and the ASRs, which are components of LOPE. And following my briefing, um, I believe Liz uh, Kaneha will be talking more about the section 203, which is the above ground storage. Oops, I am so angry. Okay, I went back. Perfect. Thank you for bearing with me. So, LOPE, what are the objectives? Um, so, before talking about the objectives, I want just to give a summary on what the purpose of the project is. So, the purpose of Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project is to increase water storage capacity in the watershed, uh, resulting in improved Lake Okeechobee water levels. Um, improve quantity, timing, and distribution of water to the North End estuaries, improve water supply for existing legal Lake Okeechobee service area or LOSA users, and to restore wetlands within the project area. So LOPE will achieve these goals and objectives uh, by reducing high volume freshwater releases from uh, Lake Okeechobee, by utilizing aquifer storage and recovery wells or ASRs. Um, and in addition, uh, although provides uh, resiliency to potential changes uh, in future climatic conditions, um, restor restoring about 5,900 acres of wetlands along the historic Kissimmee River, um, and also provides recreational facilities at multiple sites in the wetland restoration sites. So just giving that purview, um, really the objectives of LOPE are focused on ecosystem restoration, and that's covered by the improved the, the Lake uh, Okeechobee stage conditions and improved discharges to the northern estuaries, um, the objectives of ecology, uh, increased spatial extent and functionality of aquatic wildlife habitat um, within the Lake Okeechobee and the watershed, and then the water supply aspect. Uh, which is increased water supply. Um, and basically that's summarized on those three major categories. On the next slide, we will be focusing on some of the questions uh, that are to be covered uh, in the agenda. Um, and before I want to walk through a little bit of the background, right? So. After the release and review of the LOPE PIR EIS in August 2020, um, the LOPE draft report of the Chiefs of Engineers uh, and the USACE determined a revision uh, to the document that recommended plan um, included 
uh, above ground storage, wetland restoration, and ASRs was warranted. Uh, there were some concerns that were brought up forward uh, by the stakeholders uh, about acceptability. This triggered the need uh, for a second release of the draft PIR EIS in February 2022. And this release includes the removal of the WAF and 25 co-located ASRs, uh, which were associated to this uh, wetland attenuation feature. Um, it also highlighted the ASR science plan and included costs for ASR treatment and ASR science plan itself. So one of the questions of CISREP um, is related to the rationale for needing to make additional major changes um, in the third draft low PIR. Review comments received on favor from the February 2022 resulted in the need of detailed analysis of environmental effects and aquifer, and aquifer resources, um, including potential effects on nutrients um, in the recharged water going into the aquifer, the potential for mobilization of arsenic and other constituents already in the aquifer, uh, methylization of mercury, and the potential for bioclogging as a result of nutrient introduction. And in, in also uh, additional information about ASR's implementation in general and, and a governance structure, which is a phase approach, um, which includes design and construction activities paired with scientific investigations uh, detailed in the ASR science plan. Propose ASR's clusters, and this is to target some of the other question, the last question on, on that paragraph. These proposed ASR clusters are currently included in the plan um, uh, locations are based on findings from the 2015 SERP ASR regional study. And however, these locations are conceptual and may be adjusted based on the, result, the results of exploratory testing and the whole ASR science plan. Um, and the additional information that we're currently collecting. So now we're going to cover uh, the basically the second point in that in that paragraph about low benefits. So low um, can facilitate uh, and improve flexibility in the timing and distribution of water. Uh, in the lake to the northern estuaries and throughout the Lake Okeechobee watershed. Um, water can be stored during wet times to reduce damaging high lake stages and later be released into the lake to reduce the impacts of low stages during dry times. And as you can see in this slide, the storage component by, by lobe um, really increases the amount of time that the lake stage levels are within the ecological preferred stage envelope. Um, and, and also captures, and this is basically that increase in the amount of time Lake Okeechobee is within the eco ecological preferred stage envelope is covering our first objective that was presented earlier uh, in the presentation. It also cap sure. Yeah, just a clarifying question. When yes. you say LORP, are you saying LORP with ASR but not low car? Or are you saying LORP correct with just the wetland features? No, low car. Yeah. Uh, sorry, LORP includes the wetland and the ASRs. Yes. But do you have to get it authorized? As you have to get it authorized with just the wetland features separately if you're going to put that in Word of 2024. So we currently, the PIR will have, the, the PIR EIS will have the information for both, but the ASRs will be, we will clarify in the report that we're still gathering information and is pending, the authorization will be pending on that additional information that, we'll, that we're gathering as we move along. So that's why we're presenting to you um, the benefits as a whole. That's why at the beginning of my presentation, I clarify that everything that you see in this, in this presentation is basically telling the story about the wetland restoration features uh, plus the ASRs. 
In the second bullet, uh, is targeting the second objective for the project, um, and basically is showing uh, how we can capture about 5,273 acre feet of water from flowing to the Atlantic Ocean in the San Lucy and 7,495 acre feet of water flowing to the Gulf of Mexico in the Kalusahashi on a annual um, average annual. And really the combination of both uh, results uh, or represents a 21% reduction of flows to the northern estuaries. In addition, the third bullet um, is really targeting uh, the third objective that was presented um, early in this presentation, which is to provide the restoration of wetlands um, and public recreation. And the fourth bullet is really targeting the fourth objective, which is um, to reduce uh, water supply cutbacks uh, volumes by about 35%. And it is important to note that uh, the full re re realization of benefits are pending additional science, as I explained earlier, uh, from the USAC Engineering and Research Development Center, or ERDIC for short. Um, and as conditions, um, as conditions of the south, uh, uh, in 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 to answer the question about conditions south of lay of the lake. Um, I just want to clarify that the future with our project for loop uh, assumes step in place and assumes the same condition with the alternative plan. So that's how it is tied. Uh, the condition is not changing. Uh, and that was basically almost like a, a set point um, for, for this project. And as of the overall benefits uh, to the Lake Okeechobee watershed, uh, the addition of low car uh, will result in an increase in benefits in overall. Just wanted to mention that, that that's how everything is tied. So the low path forward, um, SAJ or the core um, has requested additional resources to, to revise the final PIR EIS, uh, the ROD, and uh, prepare uh, the shift report for wetland restoration component. So this is basically to include in the, in the, in the report uh, that additional data, scientific data is needed in order to pursue uh, the, the ASR component. Also, the scope uh, of this additional time for resources includes um, a revision in the project cost, so project cost updates and the re recertification, and also includes internal and external coordination. As you can see, uh, as part of also the plan is just to go to that first report uh, on the wetland with the emphasis on the wetland restoration targeted for water 2024. And in order to do this, we need to complete a uh, final PIR EIS. Um, and right now we targeted for early spring. And then uh, we will need to come back with the uh, a second report uh, for the ASRs which we don't have on a specific timeline right now as is pending additional science uh, from Eric. And just to finalize, and I know that it's difficult to read um, on, on the screen, but it's really to show how all these components are pieces of a bigger piece of puzzle. So if you look at uh, Lake Okeechobee uh, watershed uh, in, in general, uh, all these ongoing parallel efforts uh, will work together to meet the general objective for the whole watershed. Um, and just to reiterate a little bit, uh, as mentioned before, the additional scientific data that is being collected in order to reduce overall ASR's uncertainties um, will, is, is part of this uh, uh, puzzle. Uh, these data will look at the water quality uncertainties in the Florida aquifer 
uh, resulting from the treatment technology and operations of ASR wells, and will continue to address uncertainties identified in the 2015 National Research Council review of the ASR regional study uh, final technical data report. Um, and just for, for, I know it's difficult to see here. So at the top left, uh, we're just highlighting kind of like a big summary, like a high level summary of LOCAR, which is uh, being uh, led by South Florida Water Management District. Then at the top right corner, you will see the Lake Okeechobee watershed, which is really targeting uh, two main components of the yellow book. Um, which is uh, component GG, which is the ISRs, and also the OPE, which is focusing on, on the uh, wetland restorations, and basically the strategy of this phase approach. And then on, on the lower left and right side is basically the, the compendium, the overall compendium of the ASR efforts under ERDIC, the scientific effort, which is right now break down in, in basically two pieces um, and will come together to inform uh, lobe, lobe. And that's, that's my last slide, um, pending any questions. Great, right, Jeff. Yeah, so the benefits you showed, um... Or does that include from ASR as well? Yes, sir. Okay. It's wetlands and ASRs. And did the um, analysis you did, did that include um, the new operations plan for Kissimmee River that's soon going to be operating? Does that affect those wetlands? No. So uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, thing. This planning studies, um, we need to kind of set a, a baseline in time, right? So uh, the assumptions um, are basically set uh, on the, when we started the project around 2016, and it includes uh, some of the changes, but not necessarily identical as how we're seeing it now. So that will be part of th those aspects, operational aspects are picked up by operation projects uh, to that will that will be increments through throughout the years as soon as new infrastructure comes in line. So the it looks like on your schedule you intend uh, to complete the PIR EIS in 2024. Yes. And that's for the wetland features and ASR. Yes, sir. So just to, to clarify, the PIR EIS will have both components, but the emphasis will be for the wetland component. And we will just highlight in the PIR EIS that the authorization of ASRs is pending additional data that we're gathering. Okay. I, 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 it seems to... The, the project relies very heavily on ASR and to have a PIR EIS prior to finishing the science around ASR seems to be in a peculiar order. I think is um, we see it as um, like a phase approach, like an implementation phase approach. Um, the wetlands right now are the pieces that have uh, we're more certain and, and, and we can just move forward. So why hindering the construction of the wetland restorations and start that process while we wait on gathering more information on the ASR component? So that is how both of our, our agencies, or at least in my perspective, we're seeing it right now. Um, but we definitely, as soon as we receive the additional resources and we dig into this effort, uh, we're going to co coordinate all the language that needs to be included in that PIR EIS for WARDA 2024 to make sure uh, everything is clear and that we can uh, uh, proceed as intended. But do you ever separate the benefits? Because you're, you're, you're putting all your benefits in, which probably largely derive from ASR, and those are the ones with uncertainty. 
So you're selling part of the project based on high uncertainty. Do you, do you have a component of the document that just says if we only built the wetlands, these are the benefits? Yes, ma'am. Be so that's the beauty on how we create, put together the plan formulation for this particular um, study. The wetlands have been always kind of like a, a, a separable element. So as you read the, the report, uh, it has uh, the quantification of the benefits. Um, and, and then you have the, the ASR component. Uh, and then as a whole is the benefits that I showed in the summary in the slide. Okay, uh, online from Al Steinman. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, thank you, Zulamet. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. They're more technical than the prior questions you've had. Uh, one of the benefits you identify is to have more time in the ecological beneficial zones of, of Lake Okeechobee. And is that, is, is that definition in your mind zone D? What are you considering a more ecologically beneficial um, lake stage? Ecologically, uh, uh, lake stage uh, is really the fluctuation within that uh, desire ecological regime. Uh, that's that's how I'm referring uh, in 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 that bullet. I, I guess my let me rephrase it. My question is, since um, Zone D is so large now, virtually any change that you do in the schedule is going to put more more time in that zone. And so, if that's considered ecologically beneficial. That's kind of a, I don't know, in my mind, it's a red herring as a benefit. So without knowing exactly where more time is going to be spent based on these changes, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify what exactly that benefit will be. And I guess I'm trying to figure out, has that analysis been done to give us that kind of detail? Sure, it's included in the, in the PIR EIS that was released on, on June 2022. And um, just for percentages, what I have here in my notes is that we're showing about 29.1% as compared to 27.7 for the Fisher Without Project uh, when modeled over the 41 year period of record. That's looking at the whole period of record, right? Um, so I, we can definitely look at the PIR EIS to see if that different, uh, different uh, like how to see the data differently. But that's the overarching um, statement that we met that we did through the PIR EIS. Is that based on LOSUM or is that based on LORS? I think sorry, is there someone? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. Wait, they're saying LORS in the audience. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> then, forget my question then. Um, <laughs> the second. No, the second, and I'm so sorry. No, that's I'm okay. so sorry. I didn't catch the whole the whole question. I, I so should have been you. more. I should have been more specific. Um, the second no, question no I have, I, I think it's great that you're you're doing the floodplain wetland restoration in the Kissimmee, uh, and I, from a water quantity benefit, that's great. From a water quality benefit, there needs to be wetland restoration in Taylor Creek Nub and Slough. Is there any activity that's being planned for work in that subbasin? Not no. on their lobe. Not under lobe. Okay. Thank you very much. No, no problem. And just to clarify for lobe um, on the alternative itself, we look at lores and we also took advantage of the infrastructure. So there's also some criteria that we use um, in, in the operations. So all that is well captured in the PIR EIS. Uh, but if you have future questions, uh, please feel free to reach out and I can give you more information. Thank you very much. Appreciate so, it. Did you have a question online? No, actually, Stephanie asked it. Um, I was also curious about what proportion of the benefits that you had on slide six could be attributed to ASR and what to the wetlands restoration, because I was struck that most of that would be a consequence of having increased storage to be able to mute pulses of flow in a big way, not just in the... the delay of timing that you would get in a watershed. But Stephanie asked it and you answered it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think we'll keep moving. Thanks, Ulame, Thank very you much. Very much. Uh, and next we'll hear from Liz Kaneha from the district. 
and I think she's going to pick up on ASR a little bit and uh, elaborate on low car. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Kaneha. I'm the project manager of the Lugachobi Watershed Restoration Project and the project manager for the Aquifer Storage and Recovery Program with the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, so this is a comprehensive Everglades restoration program project, meaning it's a cost share project between the Army Corps of Engineers and the South Border Water Management District. Uh, the project is still in the planning phase, which Zulamet just covered. Um, however, the district has received state funding to move forward with the implementation of ASR wells. Uh, so today I'll be focusing on the ASR program and the science plan, but also covering a little bit about LORP. Um, so this is the revised recommended plan, alternative ASR that was selected for LORP. Um, Zulamet already went over the project purpose. I'll focus a little bit more on the project features um, and in particular the ASR wells. So the um, red circles that you see on this map are the proposed locations for the ASR wells. So we're envisioning 55 ASR wells within the watershed. Um, so the number of wells in each cluster is still unknown at this time, and that's going to be determined based on the siting evaluation and aquifer suitability analysis that we're conducting. And what we're envisioning is that the wells are going to be installed in well pairs, meaning they'll be installed in two different aquifers, which is the upper Florida aquifer and the Avon Park permeable zone. And the graphic on your right is um, showing how we're implementing ASR in a phased approach based on comments by the National Research Council. So this is basically showing the timeline to build out one ASR cluster. So this would probably be the schedule for C38 South. Uh, the photos on this slide show some of the drilling activities that we have conducted already for the ASR program. We have completed continuous cores at uh, several locations, which include the C38 South, the L63 North, and the L63 South site. We are currently conducting a core at the C59 site, and that's going to be completed in the next few months. Um, we also have completed our first set of test wells at C38 North and C38 South, meaning that we'll be installed that we installed two wells in both aquifers in the Avon Park permeable zone and also the upper floor and aquifer. Um, aquifer pump tests or APT tests are currently underway along the two C38 South Canal, I'm sorry, the C38 Canal sites. Um, we're anticipating some reports identifying what was found during those APT tests in March of 2024. Um, and what the APT tests do is it helps us determine spacing for subsequent wells as we continue to build out these ASR clusters. Also ongoing is the design for the demonstration facility at C38 South. Um, so the demonstration facility is gonna be a smaller facility. It's gonna be a 10 MGD facility with uh, just utilizing two ASR wells instead of moving forward into a full scale design. So we're using a more conservative approach and testing different um, treatment technologies or membrane technologies for longer durations to help us answer some of those uncertainties with ASR wells. Um, so just as a reminder, because I think this was presented before at CISRUP, um, the purpose of the ASR sci science plan is to address the National Research Council uncertainties associated with ASR wells and also guide our ASR program in a phased implementation approach while incorporating science. Workshops are intended to be held annually or as needed with the peer review panel and the public to discuss these studies and findings, and then the plan will be updated with guidance from the independent peer review panel. Initially, the plan was intended to be updated annually. However, once we started constructing the wells and doing some of the science, we realized that maybe we need more time instead of giving an update every year. So we're intending to update the plan as data is available. The first version of the ASR science plan was published back in 2021, and that's available on our website. Uh, we also prepared a draft 2022 ASR sci science plan that is also on our website, um, and that was never finalized. And the reason for that um, plan not being finalized is we're waiting for some of these proposed science activities to be included in, um, in the next update of the ASR science plan. So as Ulamet had mentioned, Erdic is going to be conducting some research, and we thought it would be more comprehensive report to include some of their research or at least some of their studies they're intending to do in this up next update of the ASR science plan. So instead of it being called the 2022 final plan, we'll probably just call it version two of the ASR science plan. 
there's four main uncertainties that the Corps has highlighted, which is concerns with water quality, construction costs, O&M costs, and well recovery performance. For the water quality concern, we're looking into ways to remedy for arsenic by creating a mixing zone or a deoxygenation system. For the cost concern, we're looking, um, our consultant actually prepared very detailed costs for the treatment costs and O&M costs um, predicted for the future. And these costs were documented in the LORP ASR treatment proof of concept report that was prepared back in July of 2022. For the well recovery performance, we're installing continuous cores, conducting aquifer performance tests, and also um, conducting uh, localized groundwater models. Sorry. To determine the attributes of the aquifer and also avoid some of these fractures and also maximize our recovery efficiencies. Um, you may recall, if you've looked at the PIR, um, what the recovery efficiencies that were assumed in the LORP PIR. So for the Lord PIR, we assumed a very conservative approach. Uh, we uh, thought there would be a 70% efficiency recovery for wells installed in the upper floor and aquifer, and then a 30% recovery efficiency for wells installed in the Avon Park permeable zone. So what we noticed is that these rates are also consistent with the SERP a ASR pilot project that we conducted at the Kissimmee River ASR well site. And it's also in the same range as other publications um, that we notice in USGS publications. Um, so Erdic has begun conducting their own studies and is currently under contract with the district. They've already begun collecting some core materials at some of our project sites, and they have begun water quality studies to address arsenic and geochemical concerns. Um, they also intend to begin additional studies this coming year. Uh, to help address some of the concerns with treatment and also cost. So this may have looked familiar, familiar to the uh, committee, but we've actually shown this before while presenting on LORP ASR, but I think it's worthwhile highlighting just to show some of the concerns and what we're addressing with water quality. Um, so a treatment technology evaluation was conducted to meet permit requirements. So prior to injecting water into the ground and into the aquifer, the water must meet FDEP UIC requirements for ASR facilities, meaning it must meet primary and drinking water standards. So the photo on the top left shows um, the setup for the proof of concept testing at the Kissimmee River ASR well site. And um, we tested several, uh, used several different technologies to see which one would work best which included the media filtration and UV, and also ceramic membranes and polymeric membranes. So overall, what we saw is that the membrane technology performs better compared to media filtration and UV. It was also noted that ceramic membrane performs better than polymeric membrane because it constantly um, met drinking water standard criteria for color. Um, we also determined that with the dark color of the surface water, that comes from the C38 canal, um, UV dose is um, unfortunately wouldn't work. So um, with the color in our project area, it would be very difficult to remove coliform bacteria by using UV treatment. Uh, the photo on the bottom right shows what the, uh, the color difference between the, between the raw water that was collected from the C38 canal versus the color of the water once it has been run through some of our treatment trains during the proof of concept testing. And it shows the different vendors that we use during that testing period. According to the National Research Council, arsenic mobilization is a concern with ASR. During the design of the demonstration facility, the district is cons considering various technologies to mitigate for arsenic based on other facilities in Florida. For the preliminary design, our consultant is recommending the use of chemical addition um, by using sodium hydrosulfide. Um, I also want to highlight what we do know about arsenic from the Kissimmee River ASR well. So if you can look to the graphic on your right, um, the FDEP groundwater criteria for arsenic is 10 ppb, which is shown by the red line on this graphic. So what we saw um, was that with arsenic um, during cycles two and four, it actually was below the 10 PPB criteria. So we were anticipating if we were continue to cycle test, we would probably see that similar um, degradation of the arsenic concentrations going down over time. OK, 
Okay, so moving on to the ERDIC studies. So these are the proposed tasks. Um, they actually haven't officially been approved by the district yet. It's pending governing board approval, which is going to governing board next month in February. Um, according to the CORE's ERDIC group, um, engineering considerations for ASR can be grouped into three broad categories. The first category pertains to the mobilization and release of pollutants contaminants or hazardous toxic and radioactive waste constituents. Uh, the first category is primarily driven by the uncertainties associated with the rate and extent of mobilization of arsenic and other metals in the Florida aquifer system, but also includes uh, the concern for increased potential of mercury methylation in receiving surface water bodies due to elevated levels of sulfate in recovered groundwater. The second and third category pertains to the first cost construction and long-term O&M cost uncertainty. These are driven by the need for water treatment that may include pretreatment of injected water to applicable standards, any pretreatment to minimize constituents in the injected water that may mobilize arsenic, any treatment of the recovered water to the applicable standards of that receiving surface water body to include elevated sulfur concentrations, and pretreatment to prevent the aquifer from clogging or accumulating suspended solids in the injected water. So additionally, ASR well performance has a secondary uncertainty for long-term O&M um, since aquifer porosity and permeability may change over time due to this suspected biogrowth, which may also af um, affect long-term performance. So here are the tasks included in the ERDIC studies. Task A is for the collection of core material for laboratory investigations. Task B is for batch and small scale column studies to characterize arsenic speciation and distribution within the Florida aquifer system and geochemical reactions that occur when the Florida aquifer system is exposed to representative surface water. Task C is for the intermediate scale reactive transport studies. And task D is for the development of calibrated and validated <clears throat> reactive transport groundwater models capable of simulating field scale ASR injections and associated changes in groundwater. Task E is for the surface water treatment characterization. Uh, so this graphic here shows how the proposed ERDIC studies are interrelated and dependent. And this is when it starts getting really confusing. <laughs> Uh, Tasks B and C are designed to characterize arsenic-associated biochemical reactions, and the laboratory investigations proposed in Tasks B and C require subsurface core material from the Upper Florida and APPZ aquifer. They also require groundwater from both of these aquifers and physical samples of surface water that reflect the expected composition of treated water that will be injected into the Florida aquifer during ASR. The goal of task A is to obtain the necessary core material and groundwater for task B and C. Task E will develop a pilot system to evaluate proposed surface water treatment strategies and provide water samples for the batch and column studies in task B and C. So the results of the analysis obtained in task B and C will be integrated with available aquifer data and used in task D to develop a reactive transport model, which then will be used to simulate um, both ASR performance and the fate and transport dynamics. So um, this ability to track arsenic, fate, and transport will provide the basis for assessing how strategies designed to prevent mobilization of arsenic and other constituents of concern will be um, how it will be affected across a well field over time. Um, so here are a list of some of the studies that have been conducted by the district that will be included in our next version of the ASR science plan. Uh, we have completed a seismic study and core analysis with the Florida Gulf Coast University and also the United States Geological Studies. ERDIC has revised their statement of work to complete their studies. And that, like I mentioned, is going to February governing board for approval prior to execution. Um, we have completed, or we are near complete, our aquifer pumping test along the C-38 canal, uh, the, the two sites there at C-38 South and North. And we also have completed our ecological studies for the year of 2023, and both of those reports for the aquifer pumping test and ecological studies will be uh, received sometime in March and uh, April of 2024. 
So today we don't really have any technical data to share with the committee. Um, that will be provided at our next upcoming ASR peer review panel workshop. So this is the um, graphic that shows our schedule to update the next ASR science plan. So, okay, last slide. Um, so this is a schedule to complete our next version of the ASR science plan. Um, the team is going to be kicking off their, uh, their ASR science plan revisions in January. Those will continue through May. Um, we intend to meet with the peer review panelists in June of 2024, and that will be open to the public as well. Um, the, at that time, the panelists will be given a draft of the version two ASR science plan so they can take a look at what we intend to present. Um, and then after we meet with the panelists based on their findings and their report that they prepared, um, we would begin updating any final revisions to our ASR science plan. And our uh, goal would be to complete the science plan in fall of 2024, but no later than mid-December of 2024. And here are the links to um, the LORP website and also the ASR website if you are interested in seeing our 2022 ASR science plan draft or our finalized 2021 ASR science plan. Thanks, Liz. I think you have a presentation prepared for LOCAR. Is that correct? Correct. I think in the interest of time, we're going to go straight to that if you have the stamina. Yep. <laughs> hey, Liz. While they're working on the uh, audiovisual, the, you've mentioned that there's a couple of test wells that have been started in um, 38 South and 38 North two sets of test wells that have already been drilled and completed at C38 North and South. And we're currently constructing another set of well pairs at L63 North. And what's the difference is the test well, would that be um, once it's tested, is it? It will be drilled? converted to an ASR well. So yeah. it's fully, it would be fully operational. But, but right now it's still, we would need the treatment first and then it could become operational. So it's just right now a well. Okay, what, when do you plan on beginning sort of recharge and recovery tests in that? Is there, do you have a time frame for that? Yeah, it's still several years out. So we're beginning the design for the demonstration facility, which um, is ongoing right now. So that's probably going to be maybe another two years. And then construction would be another year or two after that. So it'd probably be another three, four years before we can actually start cycle testing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, moving on. So in addition to LORP and ASR, I'm also the project manager of LOCAR, which is north of Lake Okeechobee component A reservoir. Um, so this is a feasibility study that is being conducted by the district. Um, <clears throat> and then I wanted to give a brief overview because I don't think this project was ever discussed at CISRIP before. Um, so what's different about this study versus our normal planning effort is this is a feasibility study that is conducted by the non-federal sponsor, I mean the district, and um, so we'll be, be, we'll be leading the feasibility study, and we'll also be assisting with the environmental impact statement for LOCAR under Section 203 of the Federal Water Resources Development Act. So the district is taking the lead on the feasibility study, which includes the coordination, modeling, and report preparation. Um, however, the report has to be technical and policy compliant with federal planning processes. So we're working with our federal uh, partner, the Army Corps of Engineers, and they're providing technical assistance and also helping with federal activities for this study. So the goal is for the district to transmit the feasibility study report to the Assistant Secretary of the Army. And then um, once they have reviewed it, it will be submitted to Congress for authorization. And once the report is actually approved, it will become part of the SERP program and make its debut on the IDS. Uh, so this graphic shows the low car study area. The study area is positioned directly north of the lake in the center of the state and south of the Kissimmee-Orlando area. The study area is outlined in turquoise. 
It encompasses both estuaries, the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries. And within the study area, there are sub, uh, four sub watersheds that include the Fishing Eating Creek, Indian Prairie, and Taylor Creek Nub and Sluice sub watersheds. And it also includes drainage basins S65D and S65E of the Lower Kissimmee sub watersheds. So this area looks really similar, the study area to LORP, um, but the two projects are separable. So LORP will be continuing moving forward with the wetland sites and ASR wells, and then LOCAR is focused solely on above ground storage. So we're looking at that feature that was removed from LORP, the wetland attenuation or WAF, the above ground storage feature. So that's the purpose of LOCAR. The goal of the Lake Okeechobee Component A project is to um, obtain 200,000 acre feet of storage north of Lake O. Uh, the purpose is to store water during wet periods or when there's excess water in the system and later use the water during dry periods when Lake Okeechobee water levels are low. Uh, the increased storage capacity would help keep the lake within that ecological preferred band and benefit the lake's ecosystem. The project would also benefit the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries by reducing those discharges from the lake that impact their ecosystems. So in general, the project will keep water in the system for environmental and water supply uses. So here are the, the alternatives that were considered for LOCAR. All of them are targeting 200,000 acre feet of storage, but the acreages for each alternative do vary between 12,000 to 19,000 acres. And the watered step also varies between 10 to 18 feet. So for low car alternative one, which is that top left graphic, that's referred to as the potential reservoir. It's approximately 12,000 acres in size and would have a maximum water depth of 18 to 19 feet. Low car alternative two, which is the top right graphic, it's referred to as the dual reservoir. The two reservoirs combined are approximately 19,000 acres in size, and it would have a maximum depth of approximately 10.2 feet. Uh, Locar Alternative 3 is referred to as the North-South Reservoir. It's that bottom right graphic. It's approximately 13,700 acres in size, and we would have a water depth of approximately 14 feet. Rough order magnitude costs, or ROM costs, and modeling were prepared for the three alternatives. All of the alternatives perform very similarly because they had the same acre, uh, acre storage benefit of 200,000 acre feet. However, the cost did vary between each of the alternatives because of land acquisition, uh, the dam embankment construction cost, and also infrastructure costs. Uh, for low car, the recommended plan is alternative four, which is a modified version of alternative one. So alternative one was modified to avoid a environmentally sensitive area at the southern end of the reservoir. It is approximately 12,000 acres in size, and it would have an average water storage, storage depth of 18 feet and provide that 200,000 acre feet uh, goal for storage. The length of the perimeter dam, which goes around the reservoir, is approximately 18 miles, and the total length of the divider dam between the two cells is 2.7 miles. Uh, there will be two inflow pump stations. One inflow pump station uh, is located at S84, which is denoted by the uh, square that says PS. So the purpose of that pump station is to pump water upstream towards the reservoir. And the other pump station is located at the southeast corner of the reservoir. And that would be uh, to pump water into the reservoir at 1500 CFS. There will also be a gravity discharge back to the system to the C41A canal via two gated structures, and the discharge would be totaling 3,000 CFS. Uh, the location of the, res the two reservoir outflow culverts allows for water to be released from the reservoir into the C41A canal, either upstream or downstream of S83, um, to allow conveyance of water to the Indian Prairie subbasin via the C41A, the C41, C39A, C40, or C38 uh, canal, as well as Lake Okeechobee. And the perimeter canal around the feature allows for water to be collected from seepage and also rainwater, and then be able to be returned back to the reservoir. 
The reservoir is being designed to current Army Corps of Engineer dam safety requirements, and ultimately it's being monitored by the dam safety program. Uh, it incorporates the Corps' three R's, which stand for robust, redundant, and resilient to meet modern dam safety criteria. The design also underwent a risk assessment review process by the Corps of Engineers Center of Excellence for Dam Safety to maintain flood protection and water supply. The reservoir will be designed for extreme storm events, including a PMP for 54 inches of rainfall and also control waves in category five storms. The design will incorporate recreation features such as boat ramps and nature areas. Uh, for low car, we use the regional basin models, which is uh, typical for CERT projects, and it included the recover performance metrics to help show the effects of storage. Several scenarios were produced to demonstrate hydrology changes as storage was added to the system. The existing condition baseline is the current condition, which includes existing projects or planned infrastructure such as LOSUM, C44, Kissimmee operations and COP. Uh, the projected future without scenario includes the projected future conditions without the projects and includes the EAA reservoir, the STA and STA, the C43 project, IRL, Kissimmee headwaters operation, SEP and LOSO. And the future with the project is referred to as LOCAR, which is denoted by the LCR1 run. And you'll see that in our um, draft reports as well. For LOCAR, uh, we developed three different project alternatives, uh, which are LCR1, the tentatively se selected plan that, return that uh, turned into the revised recommended plan, um, LCR2 and LCR3. So for the modeling, we looked at storage and conveyance features for each alternative, as well as diversion to and recovery from storage features. Water could be released from the C41 and C41A canals once the reservoir was about a third full to maintain and improve water supply. Overall, what we saw was that the three alternatives performed very similarly, and they all targeted that 200,000 acre feet of storage. However, LCR1 was our selected TSP due to land acquisition and the cost differential identified in the ROM costs. Under ideal conditions and when the lake is within the ecological preferred band, the shoreline marsh is approximately 100,000 acres in size. Submerged aquatic vegetation occurs in the deepest areas of the marsh around eight and a half to 11 feet in elevation. Then sparse vegetation like grasses and bulrush grow from about 10 to 11 feet in elevation. And then at about 12 to 15 feet, there's a broad diverse marsh that's seasonally flooded at different water depths and for different durations which provides a wide variety of habitat for fish and wildlife. Maintaining stages within this ecological envelope or between roughly 12 to 15 feet per year maintains this diverse habitat. When lake stages are too high for too long, it reduces the size of the marsh, pushing plant communities towards the levee, which reduces the presence of shallow marsh communities. When stages are too low for too long, everything moves down slope, which dries out shallow marshes and converts them to uplands or woody species. And it allows uh, marsh plants to take over areas that were previously SAV or open water. Uh, so this is why the performance metrics for Lake Okeechobee, uh, for the lake, <clears throat> are focused on how long stages are above or below or within that ecological envelope, as well as the duration that uh, the time the lake is at those stages at specific elevations. So to measure the benefits of the lake, we rely on stage duration curves, which show the benefits of the lake. Um, so this is gonna show you with the addition of LOCAR, what happens to the lake. Uh, so what we see with LOCAR is um, there's an improvement at the extreme high stage and we spend less time at this stage. So you'll see the two dot, the two circles at the um, top left of the graphic. It shows a decrease from 10 to 2% at that high extreme uh, elevation. And then at the low end, we also see less time in the extreme low stages. So overall with low carb, what we're doing is flattening the curve 
and we're minimizing the amount of time that we're either at these high extreme stages or, or um, extreme low stages. Liz, we're way over time. So if you could okay. sort of fly through hitting the benefits of the key point. Okay, so I could just maybe skip over and kind of summarize what I think the cut backs are kind of important. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the water supply cutbacks, um, we look at reductions in, uh, uh, we look at the previous years of drought over the period of record and compare the project conditions to the existing condition baseline and future without. So for low carb, what we saw is, uh, is less water cutbacks, meaning more water supply reliability for water use of the Lake Okeechobee service area. And then this slide here just kind of highlights some of the benefits that we'll see with low car. Um, so we'll see benefits to the lake, estuaries, um, and both lake and estuaries. So some of the benefits that we'll see is, um, is uh, improvement in liquid ecology by reducing drastic water levels and fluctuations. We'll see an improvement in marsh inundations. Uh, we'll see improved conditions for emergent and submergent aquatic vegetation while also improving water supply. Um, for the estuaries, uh, we'll see an increase in fish populations while also improving the timing and distribution of flows to the estuaries. Um, so with both of these, uh, with this project, we'll also see benefits uh, via recreation and also economic opportunities. So moving along quickly to get to the timeline, this has been an expedited planning effort uh, so we're almost at the finish line, as you can see. So we've already released our draft EIS that was out for review, and that comment period ended back in December. So the team is um, working on finalizing the EIS. We're trying to target uh, completion of that report by the end of January and submitting it to the ASA in February and then on to Congress sometime in March or shortly thereafter. And um, we also have a web page for LOCAR, so you can see past engagements and some past presentations. Um, and also, you'll be able to see the feasibility study. So the EIS is available on the CORE's web page, and um, the feasibility study is available on uh, the district's web page. And that I'll take any questions. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, we have time for a question. We do, yeah. Um, Hi, thanks, Liz. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, um, and I'm Casey Brown uh, from the University of Massachusetts. Um, on maybe just a few slides back, you showed bar charts of reduction in demand cutbacks. Um, and I just am trying to understand how to interpret these as well as some of the previous graphs. So the um, what we really want to compare low car one with is the salmon colored bars. Is that right? So <clears throat> the so that's the future without the project, which is assuming some assumption of current infrastructure that's in place or about to be online. Or something like this. Correct. Yes. So the the red bar is it includes. Um, the future without, which includes a couple projects, so the C43 and the EAA. And so we're basically showing with the addition of low car, you'll see that the, um, the reduction, the green bar is lower, showing that we have less water supply cutbacks. So it's an improvement. So less is better in this case. Yeah, right. And I'm just trying to interpret these. So for some of them, for example, I'm sort of curious why how these are chosen, but you have 2001 uh, highlighted in 2007, 2008. Maybe these are the years in which cutbacks took place, I guess. These are the sense. years, yeah, for over during our period of record for modeling that had the severe years of drought. Yes. Yeah. So. And so I'm just wondering, are these differences, do you think that these differences that are shown here are significant relative to, say, the uncertainty in the modeling that produces these results? Because I guess I'm saying the changes are kind of small, and maybe they're within the error or confidence interval of the model. So, yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering how to interpret I, results I, like these. They seem small differences, I guess. I think the overall goal is just to show that you know water supply is going to be improved over time. 
um, I mean, with the with the project. So even if you're looking at like, for example, 1973 to 1974, I mean, it's still a significant jump. So you'd have 6% less cutbacks in that time period if we experience the same amount of drought. Um, but, you know, this is just one project to help with those, you know, that drought. So there's other projects in the area too that could also, you know, provide input and support to, you know, help increase the, the cutbacks. Thanks. Go ahead, Tracy. Thanks. Tracy Quirk from Louisiana State University. Um, and this maybe sort of ties into Casey's question, but on the previous slide, not now. Yeah, that. Um, so to me, my a lot of the benefits um, that you put forth have to do with benefits to wetlands or a littoral zone along the lake edge. Um, this figure doesn't look like there's that big of a difference between, you know, project with low par and versus without. So I was just wondering, and we were also having some discussion about how 200,000 acre feet got chosen for storage quantity and I just wanted to. Okay, so for, I'll answer the second question first. So the goal for the 200,000 acre feet of storage, that was in the yellow book. So it was one of the components and that was what was envisioned for SERP. So it, it envisioned a reservoir north of the lake for 200,000 acre feet. And so with LORP, we tried to achieve that goal, but we had received a lot of um, just negative feedback um, and lack of support for above ground storage. So we started looking for different alternatives in that same area north of the lake and so we went farther north, uh, north of the C41A, and that's where we're placing this reservoir. Um, as far as the benefits for the lake, um, our lake guy, Zach, he was really impressed with the benefits. He thought this looked really great. So I guess that's significant. Um, the extreme high, he seemed really happy about because with LORP, when we modeled it for just the ASR wells, we didn't see a significant deep, like a significant improvement. So um, this project actually shows quite a bit of lift in comparison to LORP when we had the wetland attenuation feature because the storage was much less. Okay, thanks, Tracy. One quick question because about the differences in these scenarios, when I looked at the document, I thought that the models were different in the future without compared to the existing condition that you used loathsome for one and lures for the other. And maybe you fix that now as you're doing it because what you present here, you said you use the same one for both, but can you tell me what was done? I may have to call on Walter to help answer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Don't get too laughs> I mean, I know everything was rushed and it, <laughs> yes. Hey, good afternoon all, can you hear me? Yeah. This is Walter Wilcox with the Interagency Modeling Center in the Florida Management District. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a process procedure question in there. Um, the EA reservoir, as authorized, is based on an analysis that has LORS 08 as the basis because of when that project was authorized. So there hasn't been a step yet to circle back and update the EA reservoir work with the most recent science and planning that was done for LOSA. So when you look at the document, it gets a little confusing because in certain parts, in order to adhere to the policy in the way that all those federal requirements that Liz just mentioned to lay out everything in the way that it's authorized. We have to do a comparison with both 408 and with LOSM, which is kind of like the, the real trajectory forward with the best science and policy that we expect. So you'll see both this presentation focuses on LOSM to make it a little more clear what the storage is actually doing. And you know, going back to Zulmet's point earlier, the, uh, the PIR actually does the same thing for LORP. It looks at both floors away and low so to kind of make sure that the actions we're taking are complementary with each other and also will work regardless of the regulation schedule that's being. So you do have a modeling this. that can do future without an existing condition and alternatives using all the same baseline? Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So we have two sets of comparisons existing condition to future with lowers to future okay. with project with lowers, okay. existing to get condition to low some, to low some with project. So, well, October? <laughs> Just to make it complicated. It's in the appendices report. And again, depending <laughs> on where you are in the report, you're, you'll, you're you'll have to, certain It's in the feasibility yeah. study, not the EIS. Okay. So on our on our webpage on LOCAR, you'll see it in there. Appendix A, Annex A is for the modeling. 
we, we've analyzed it upside down, left, right, everything. Yeah. We, we have confidence that adding storage to the system is going to improve the performance of the lake and the northern estuaries in this case. And you know, it's kind of intuitive, but we can show that with the modeling data, um, regardless of the, the underlying regulation schedule. It seemed like adding the reservoir added more low conditions in the lake. And and I didn't know whether that was an artifact. That, I thought there was an argument that that was an artifact of the existing condition baseline yeah, if, thing. If you go from Losum today to Lores of eight yeah, plus right. in the future to Losum and storage, yeah. you can see some of those comparisons because Losum has built into it some things that increase the variability of the lake compared to Lores of eight. So, and I'll just mention to the sensitivity question, just since I have the mic, um, we, we get lost on the scale of these things, you know, like when, when you're looking at a, you know, a tenth of a foot or you know, half a foot of lake stage here, 200,000 acre feet is half a foot of lake stage. That's why you see all the benefit at the upper end, right? So on the water supply cutback, it's the same thing. It's 100,000 acre feet of cutback. It's 5% of the demand, right? So these are pretty big volumes. And when we go into work, you're going to see much smaller volumes. So yeah. just to set up the next conversation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's Al. Hello, Liz. Liz. One more question. Did I hear someone? I heard someone. It was, it's me, Al. I had a question for Liz, but since she's left the podium, it's, I can live without it. She's just coming back, and then we'll transition to public comment. It's, it's a quick question. I'm just curious why you have the two cells in the dividing dam instead of one reservoir. Oh, just for um, added dam safety. So um, if there were a breach in the dam, um, perhaps still one half of it would be intact. And so it was pretty much just for a safety feature. What we learned from other projects, just lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to public comment. And the contributors here each have three minutes at the podium. And we're going to begin with Ben Olson. And then we'll follow up with Kevin Kniff. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, I just want to let you guys know, I only really realized I could get to this meeting about two hours ago. So I didn't really practice or come up with anything. I kind of jotted some notes down to talk. So forgive me if I'm reading a little bit. Um, I do hope everybody who went on the field trip yesterday enjoyed it. It's always great to get out in the swamp and everything. Uh, I saw you guys went to the Tamiami Trail. I'm sure you saw a lot of flooding and some degradation uh, that was unfortunately created by a past generation of the Corps trying to do fixes and recoveries. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend that meeting um, or that field trip. I have now, I'm a private landowner in the West Weir Basin of the work project, which unfortunately will be reported on after this public comment period. But I have now read the draft report in its entirety, all of the appendices. I've watched every single PDT meeting. I've watched every working group and science coordination meeting I could find that was publicly available. Quite a few of them from the early years are 404 now. You can't get them online anymore. Uh, the ones that were before YouTube or before streaming on YouTube. This plan, as it's designed, fundamentally is insane, and it will destroy tens of thousands of panther and endangered animal acreage, all at the behest of certain groups that are insisting it get pushed forward. Um, what we're going to hear is how good this project is and how much we're, and, uh, we're respecting indigenous knowledge and we're going forward. But what they will leave out is the panthers in the western portion of the West Weir that will be flooded at the behest of indigenous knowledge. Um, the only panther territory that's acknowledged in the report, and I went through it pretty extensively, is in the North Feeder STA area. They speak about the 3,000 acres that will be flooded and destroyed of primary panther territory, and that they will use panther credits to restore land where panthers aren't currently living to offset that. That's 3,000 acres, and they're talking about restoring some 5,000 acres, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me on that. Conservatively, the Wingate Mill and Lard Can Canal footprint would be 12,000 acres. That's just the sheet flow that if the project works, the Corps intends to flood. And it all floods into what we call the Kissimmee Billy Strand. That doesn't include another 10,000 acres up there, which I think will flood with this plan, nor does it include another 12,000 acres, which I think will flood when the Kissimmee Billy Strand culvert system is closed, nor does it include 
all of the land in and around a crazy little private landowner group that we call Looneyville. Um, that's its name. It was owned by Mr. Looney. Uh, <laughs> the, the backfilling that we intend to do on privately owned land will flood areas such as the privately owned Panzer Conservation Area, specifically designed to protect panthers right now. In the modeling, as we have it, in the best case scenario, that will be with like an additional foot of water sitting on it. I don't think cats like the water very much. Last year, before one of these meetings, the day before I was driving from my property to town so I could, you know, I could go to the meeting, I came across a panther right on top of the Kissimmee Billy culvert. That is a culvert that my great grandfather put in four generations ago on a road we now call Boy Scout Road. It goes to Mr. Ronnie Bergeron's property. What this plan would do is put in a closable culvert that up until a few months ago, we thought was totally out of the plan. And it, I, for months, we have asked what the, operational of, uh, what the operational orders of this culvert will be. Who's going to control when this culvert opens and closes? Because we're concerned the water from the Wingate Mill and Lard Can Canal will sheet flow into this area as designed, and then it will back up because it's not flown through Mr. Bergeron's property. That's all Pine Islands. Some might trickle through. You guys plan on putting four culverts in there. Some might trickle through, but the majority of it will have to back up and find another path. I was told this is conjecture by water management a few weeks back. They said, we haven't done the modeling, but when we do the modeling, we'll figure it out. And that was one of the biggest red flags to me. We're I, I skipped around a little bit, I apologize. But what we're talking about, uh, Mr. James Sealers, I believe, uh, was talking about a concern, which I wrote down here, uh, that the committee was moving forward on a PIR EIS plan without really finishing the science. But water management is acknowledging to me, they haven't even run a data analysis on what happens when the culverts are closed. So this plan gives unilateral authority to this culvert, the culvert that my great grandfather put in, and they're expanding it some six to eight times more water flow than already is. Unilateral control to the Seminole tribe of Florida under indigenous ecological or under indigenous tribal ecological knowledge. Under that executive order, they do not have to say when they close the culvert. They don't have to say why they close the culvert. They can keep the culvert closed as long as they want and damn be the consequences. I mean, it's clear from the draft report, there is no concern on the private landowner land. And as I've said time and again, I am happy to work with you guys to show you a plan that would work because you acknowledge you used LIDAR. Your triangles for elevations are not accurate. We've shown that to the manager, the uh, project managers of this team. They, I'll, I'll finish up. They have no concern for that. What they do care about is pushing this forward behind closed doors. I propose a plan, which will be in my draft report. It includes adding closable culverts into the West Feeder Basin Canal, stopping the flooding into the tribal lands, the Mixed tribal lands. I've got no problem with fixing these issues, but we will not do it at the expense of tens of thousands of acres, which will probably cause another generation, uh, we'll wind up with another generation of Army Corps giving field trips to people on how to fix the next problem. We can do this together. We don't have to do this fight, but we will not put this project through as it is right now. I'll talk to you all next week when we have more than three minutes. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, and then we'll go to Tom McVicker and Edward Orstein. Good afternoon, panel. Kevin Kniff, Chief Sustainability Officer for the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. It's nice to see you all. It was nice to see you all yesterday. I'd like to make just a couple of quick comments for your consideration, considering your important roles as panel members, CISRA, to be um, providing your input and your recommendations um, in a congressionally mandated fashion to help us drive forward Everglades restoration planning and decision-making processes. You saw this morning or this afternoon's presentation on the IDS and um, all 68 of those projects. Okay, clearly we have a lot of engineering and construction focus, ununderstood. But I wanna cue in on, on part of that conversation that talked about flexibility. And this is something by which um, process right now doesn't lend for a lot of flexibility in how these projects come online and then the water control plans that are associated with those projects coming online in a segmented fashion. Um, flexibility, I would argue here um, on behalf of the tribe 
is something that we need to be um, much more considerate of as we're moving forward with our current plans as we have, and obviously to build in the degree of flexibility. Um, and I'd even further stretch this, um, some room for experimentation in terms of how water control plans actually come to fruition, such that we are managing water on a conditions-based manner, as opposed to a hard and fast, state-driven water control plan with a set level of criteria or constraints. Um, I will note, as you were out on the, on the Tamiami Trail yesterday and you were hearing quite a lot of input about uh, water levels within Miccosukee Conservation Area and how that compares with water levels in Big Cypress, water levels making it down south into Everglades National Park, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> the tribe spearheaded uh, the effort here this fall um, in order to affect an operational deviation at the S12A and B and the S343A and B structures in order to address the high waters in the Miccosukee Conservation Area 3A. This is after 30 plus years of almost on an annual basis, experiencing similar conditions of tree islands flooding and for which there has not been a previous uh, um, conversation really agency-wide to engage in that flexibility. I'm very happy that we have the outcome that we have now and that there's been great coordination amongst the agencies uh, as being, again, spearheaded by the tribe. This is the manner I feel that we need to be, or that you all as CISRA panel members need to be advocating for in your recommendations um, and in the capacity that you have to do so. This is where we are, is that we are seeing negative trends uh, across the landscape due to water wa operations, but we have the ability to make changes in a system that is inherently variable. And variability is an extremely important component of the Everglades. We cannot be managing for static water levels year after year, of which we're never achieving them really to begin with anyway. So let's please continue to foster conversation on where we can have flexibility and take a conditions-based management approach. With respect to lower, um, there is no controversy uh, in, in terms of wetland restoration. I'd argue that um, the tribe has been critical about the ASR uh, plan as being proposed because it is being proposed on a scale and um, with an effect that has not had, that doesn't have an analog anywhere else. This is on a level and scale that is unprecedented and therefore requires uh, a robust science-based and data-driven and highly transparent process in which uh, we evaluate whether or not as a technology for this particular application and for its scale, it is safe to be using. Now, to the Water Management District's credit, they do have a science plan as taking the recommendation from the National Council and Research, uh, National Research Council. Um, but the, the Miccosukee tribe wants to ensure that this science plan receives the due peer review and additional um, input from all stakeholders and that we work together to evaluate the results of this before moving forward with um, a plan that puts into effect um, a very high cost um, and potentially dangerous situation um, across the entirety of the landscape of the Lake Okeechobee uh, sending area. Now that brings us to low car. We've been very, very good at being able to dig very deep holes in the ground to put water into. And while recognizing that low car um, can certainly bring benefit to high lake levels, um, I want to make the criticism that there are two main reasons why you all need to be continue to be diligent on this project. First of all, there is no water quality component uh, or benefit that is given to putting water out of Lake Okeechobee, highly impacted eutrophic water at this point, and putting it into yet another deep water reservoir that doesn't have a littoral zone, doesn't have a degree of, of treating that water. And while you've heard some of the presentations talked about the importance of clean water getting back into the environment, this is not going to meet that need. Um, 
Secondly, I'd also argue that this is again, another big band-aid, a very expensive, very you know, high impact on the, on, on the landscape band-aid for an inability to have clean water moving itself down through the system, down into the Everglades, down into the big cypress, and that we are not addressing the root causes of why we need these big reservoirs and why we need to put storage into a system that did not have this kind of storage north of Lake Okeechobee by its own design. So um, that all being said, we are certainly where we are where we are, um, but I wanted to make this uh, uh, for you all not to be a wet blanket on, on any of these efforts, but for you to be continue to be diligent in asking the very reasonable questions that uh, you were asking about low carb. Thank you. Okay, Tom McVicker. Yeah, and then we have uh, Ed Edward Ordstein coming up and that will end our comments. Thank you for the time. I just have a few brief comments. My name is Tom McVicker. I'm our engineer here in South Florida, hydrologist, been practicing for 40 some years. I think I've been to 90% of the meetings of this group in your previous. <laughs> it's good to see Stephanie again. I'm here today on behalf of the Bergeron family, long-term landowners in the West Peter Canal Basin. Um, he owns property north and south of the Wingate Mill Canal, if you know the orientation of that project. The project overall work has some very good elements to it. What you're doing down by Tamiami Trail is very good. A lot of it's already under construction. A new STA, the way it's proposed, I think that's a good idea. Um, fixing the plume down at the south end of L28I onto the Miccosukee property is really important and should be done. What's proposed for the West Feeder, though, is a real, real problem. If you, if you look at L28 Interceptor, the canal was authorized in 1954, very specific purpose to drain about 70,000 acres of land upstream. Maybe 15,000 acres of that are either the Seminole Reservation or other properties owned by the Seminoles. The rest of it's all private property. The project was built to serve the private property. When it was built and proposed, the landowners up there, especially in the West Weir Basin, where the Winged Mill Canal, Arcane Canal are, got together and dug the two canals that you now call by those names, Winged Mill and Lardcan. They connect directly to the West Feeder. Um, the families that dug those canals still live out there. And that was 60 years ago, a long time ago. It means a lot to them, more than just drainage. Um, what this plan does is it says that canal no longer exists for anybody except the tribe. Only the tribe can put runoff into that canal. All the private properties got to find another home for their water. The new SDA will take part of that, but there's 36,000 acres of land that have to go through the West Feeder that no longer can go there. Uh, and all that water ends up going south. The only outlet that's described in the plan is the Kissimmee Billy, uh, the, yeah, the Kissimmee Billy Slough. Um, I'm not sure if that'll work. What, what Ben Olson called the Boy Scout Road is, is labeled on your maps as the West Boundary Road. One side of the road, and it's a little one-lane dirt road. One side is the Seminole Reservation. The other side is the Bergeron property. Has been forever. There's a small culvert there. There will be another culvert put there. But the idea that you can take all the water that flowed from 36,000 acres into the West Feeder can now be diverted over land and squeeze through one culvert where there's an existing road, it's... It's not going to work. I think the modeling that's been done this is, a, is a good model, but not for this area. It's not a tool that you can even analyze the impacts of what you're proposing. So what we are being told by the Corps is, don't worry. We're going to work all that out in the planning, engineering, and design phase. That is not going to get it. The landowners are angry, mad, sad, emotional. Uh, and I don't think it's fair to say that's what you're going to do for them. They are willing to work on a solution that works, all of them, but they're not willing to work on a solution while the government's moving ahead with a totally flawed plan and asking Congress to authorize it. Whether the Corps will say we're not going to build it doesn't matter. That plan will be there 10 years from now when the Corps might get around to building some of it, and none of the people who made the promises now are going to be around. 
including the people in Congress. So it's it's not fair. I don't think it's in the spirit of SERP. SERP never envisioned SERP projects being a tool to take that scale of private property. It's been in those families for generations, and it's still in the same families. So not too much. I have one science point, since you're a science committee. The piece of the L28I canal that's left is going to be blockaded at the south end. It's got levees on both sides. It's going to be a three and a half mile linear stormwater detention area, no outlet. And all the reservations water has got to go into that path. I don't know what kind of hydrogeology has been done to verify that. I couldn't find it in the report. Maybe it's been done. Seems like a pretty iffy concept to me. Um, and if that doesn't work, what's in the plan? There's no other, there's no fallback in the plan if that doesn't work. So I had to put a little bit of science into it. The rest of it's more <laughs> policy and motion. Thank you for the time. Hey, Edward, Edward Ornstein. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Edward Ornstein. I serve as Special Counsel on Environmental Affairs for the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. Uh, I also serve as the chair of the Indigenous Law Committee of the American Bar Association, and I am myself a tribal member of the Southeastern Muscogee Nation in Alabama. We're very grateful for the engagement and um, the time of the committee to come out to tribal lands take a look at the Osceola pool camp yesterday, take a look at those structures along Tamiami Trail. Um, we've really been working on the operation of those structures and the implication of those structures to tribal lands since the 1980s. Um, the Miccosukee have made the area now called the Miccosukee Water Conservation in Area 3A South. They're home for generations. Long before the Armed Occupation Act of 1842 allowed settlers to take land in South Florida. Uh, we're very supportive of cleaning the water coming onto the reservation through WERP and the rehydration of the Ogalio Coche or Kissimmee Billy uh, Slough and the Shark River Slough uh, through WERP and SEP. Uh, but we also want to highlight some important features of the Miccosukee Water Conservation Area and its topography. That water conservation area has long been a complex ridge and slough ecosystem with varied elevations hundreds of tree islands and hammocks, which dried down below the surface so as to allow crossing by ox carts and foot in certain dry seasons. The Miccosukee Water Conservation Area was once home to a sizable population of panthers, of wood storks, of wading birds, of Everglade snail kites. Now, due to water management restrictions, the southwestern third of that man-made basin never dries down. Not the dry season, not in any rare year, just remains a pool of water. In order to keep dry, a habitat of a subpopulation of sparrow to the southwest, which was declared virtually extirpated by the acting director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2020. And all the while, the historic sheet flow moves to the southwest. Uh, a comment made by the tour guide at Shark River really stuck out to me. After we walked around and, and took that tram ride around and saw that beautiful shallow sheet flow moving through uh, the Shark River segment of Everglades National Park, she pointed to a borrow pit that we are passing on the side of the road and explained the dramatic ecosystem shift that was taking place uh, and that led to that different appearance of the borrow pit, which had some you know, lotus floating on top, had some cattails ringing it. What really struck, stuck out to me is that that borrow pit looks more like pretty much the entirety of the southern half of Water Conservation Area 3A than anything else I've seen in the Everglades ecosystem. A lot different than the rest of the Shark River section of Everglades National Park, which is immediately to the south of Water Conservation Area 3A. I think this really speaks to the compartmentalization of the system and the erasure of ecosystem variability and habitat in Water Conservation Area 3A, in the Miccosukee Water Conservation Area 3A. So please look 
out for some forthcoming uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, which we've been working hard to prepare with our consultants uh, in compliance with the Information Quality Act, speaking to the historic ecosystem and water conservation area 3A pre-drainage, or in this case, pre-flooding. Um, Modo, thanks again for your time, and I'll be here if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a, a brief break and uh, we'll return at 3.30 sharp uh, to get an update on Western Everglades restoration plan. And we're behind schedule, so we'll run a little long. Most of the uh, total phosphorus concentrations. Next, I'll take you through what we know about the current status of water quality in the Big Cypress, mostly in, in terms of paraphyton. And finally, I'll take you through a little bit of our work comparing paraphyton in the Big Cypress to the Everglades protection areas. And just before I get started today, I'm really talking about water quality in terms of phosphorus and phosphorus enrichment. And you might be wondering, I'm taking through these old data sets. And it's because we really don't know much about the current water quality conditions or within the work footprint of the Big Cypress. I've been doing a lot of work trying to gather all the data we have and all of what we know, and most of it is older, but I will be taking you through that today. There we go. Okay, first I'm gonna take you back to the 90s with a USGS study about surface water total phosphorus. Um, in the marshes and canals of the Big Cypress. And so here I've outlined the Big Cypress in the black oval so we can see a little bit better. And during this time period, median surface water total phosphorus in the marshes and canals range from about nine to 18 parts per billion. And just to provide a little perspective, during that same time period, uh, phosphorus concentrations in the Everglades National Park range from about one to 11 parts per billion. So we're seeing slightly higher concentrations in the Big Cypress compared to the Everglades National Park. Next, these are some images from the EPA remaps 1995 and 1996 sampling event, which included the Big Cypress National Preserve. Here on the left, uh, these are surface water total phosphorus concentrations from the marsh environment, and on the right are from the canal environment. And again, I've highlighted the Big Cypress in that black oval. Um, just so you know, these uh, scales for phosphorus are different for the different graphs. So during this time period, surface water total phosphorus in the marshes ranged from approximately zero to 20 parts per billion, and the canals ranged from two to 20 parts per billion, with one measurement in the L28 measuring around 100 parts per billion. So we're seeing really similar measurements from the EPA as we did in the last slide from the USGS study. Just one thing to know, um, these concentrations are relatively low, but the EPA only samples where they can land their helicopters. So this is not necessarily a comprehensive sampling of the marsh environment. Um, I also want to point out that the EPA, EPA sampled again in 2005 and 2014, uh, but those events did not include the Big Cypress. So we don't have data from that time, uh, but they also went and sampled in 2023. And that sampling event did include the Big Cypress, which we're really excited about. And we'll have access to those data soon. Next, I wanna zoom in a little bit more about what we know about the work footprint within the Big Cypress. 
So here is some data from the DB Hydro database. Um, the last time that surface water total phosphorus concentrations were taken in this region was 2011. So here I'm showing the surface water total phosphorus a geometric means from 2000 to 2011 across those seven stations. And you can see that this, uh, these concentrations range from about 4.3 to 20.3 parts per billion. I know those numbers may be a little small to those in the back, but I did want to point out that the higher concentrations tended to be on the northern and eastern portions of the preserve. And my suspicion is that these stations were influenced by the canals, the L28 in that northeastern portion of the preserve, and the L28 tieback on that bottom eastern portion of the preserve. So just to summarize what we learned from the water quality conditions from 1990 to 2011, we saw that surface water total phosphorus concentration ranged from approximately four to 20 parts per billion over a couple of different data sets, indicating both the presence of highly oligotrophic habitat, but also some areas of phosphorus enrichment near input sources. Now, while we don't have current water quality data from within the work footprint in terms of surface water total phosphorus, we do have periphyton data. And lots of research in the greater Everglades has shown that periphyton can be a really great indicator of phosphorus load. Um, and sometimes it can be an even better indicator of phosphorus load than surface water total phosphorus measurements. And that's because these marshes are so oligotrophic that as soon as phosphorus comes into the marshes, it is rapidly assimilated by the uh, microbial communities, including the periphyton. And so Evelyn and I had a chance to go out to the warp zone in the fall of 2022 to do some sampling. And this is an image from that trip. And I just want to point out that visually, the periphyton and macrophyte communities from the marshes in the warp zone are very visually similar to what we see in the low phosphorus marshes of Everglades National Park. And the data that we collected from that trip support that same idea. This is that same graph I showed earlier, but now I am showing periphyton map phosphorus concentrations from that sampling trip. So the, here the units are different. They are micrograms of phosphorus per gram of dry periphyton map. This is a little small, but the sides are coded as either green or yellow. Green are concentrations that are less than 200 micrograms for phosphorus per gram of mat, and the yellows are greater than 200. That's just because previous research has shown that concentrations of over 200 can be indicative of phosphorus enrichment. So over the sampling trip, we saw that uh, concentrations range from about 121 to 396 micrograms of phosphorus per gram of dry mat. Once again, indicating there might be some stations that have seen phosphorus enrichment, especially along this northern and eastern boundary. Again, I suspect that could be because of canal inputs. We also had a chance to analyze diatom assemblages uh, from these samples. And what we found was really exciting. So here I am showing you a mean percent relative abundance of diatom taxa across those seven stations. The right hand side, you can see the names of the diatoms, which might not mean much to a lot of some people here. Some people might know. Uh, but what's really exciting is that these taxa are representative of highly oligotrophic communities that we really only see in the lowest phosphorus uh, sites in the Everglades. And so it's real, these communities are rare, so it's cool that we are also seeing them in the thick cypress. You might also notice that there's only about eight taxa that make up 90% of the assemblages. And that's a relatively low number. Again, something we only see in the Everglades. Uh, to put it in perspective, if I went to another stream or wetland or lake in the rest of the United States and I took a sample of diatoms, I might find 50 taxa. And that's because in the Everglades, only a low number of taxa can withstand these low phosphorus conditions. And this is just an image of some of those diatoms, Mastagoya calcarea on the left, and Insyanema evergladiatum on the right. And this is just a highlight. Again, we're seeing these same taxa in the Big Cypress as we do in the Everglades National Park. Now I want to zoom out just a little bit and tell you uh, what we know about current water quality conditions uh, that's with outside the work footprint and compare that to what we're seeing within the work footprint. So um, the data set I'm going to focus on next is the South Florida and Caribbean Monitoring Network's parapite and sampling that has been occurring yearly since 2009. Um, and these black circles represent their sampling locations for the 2022 sampling effort. You might notice that a lot of these, it's kind of contained in this northwestern corner of the preserve. 
And that's because park staff identified this area as being of high importance because of potential agricultural runoff to the north of the preserve. I'm now going to color code these with their paraffite and MAC total phosphorus concentrations. So here I have the SFC in samples in circles and those warp samples I showed earlier in squares. And the paraffite and MAC total phosphorus concentrations are coded as green for less than 200, yellow, red, and then purple for increasing levels of phosphorus concentrations. So uh, two takeaways here. The first is that uh, the warp zone generally has lower paraffite map total phosphorus concentrations than that northwestern corner of the preserve. Uh, in the warp zone, we did not see concentrations over 400, but in the FCFCN sample, some concentrations were up to 2,000 micrograms of phosphorus per gram of dry mat. The next thing I want to point out is that those high phosphorus area are really contained in that very northwestern portion of the preserve. Uh, the warp zone paraffin is pretty close to some of the more interior sites of the Big Cypress from the SFCN samples. Uh, next, we also compare diatom assemblages from the warp zone to the SFCN samples. Here I'm visualizing the diatom assemblages with a non-metric dimensional scaling plot. So here each point represents a diatom assemblage from an independent sample uh, and distance represents similarity. So the closer the points, the more similar the diatom assemblage is, the further away, the more dissimilar the assemblage is. Uh, I'm using the same coloring and the codes as in the previous slide. Uh, so two things here. The first is that you can see the warp assemblages are really close to the low phosphorus assemblages from the SFCN data set. That means these assemblages are really similar. So we're seeing those oligotrophic taxa that are rare and only in Everglades communities and low phosphorus sites outside of the work zone as well. Um, I also want to point out that the paraffite and mat total phosphorus concentrations separate along that primary axis. So what this means is the diatom assemblages from the low phosphorus sites are different than from the high phosphorus sites. Now I'm adding in environmental vectors that represent uh, environmental factors associated with those diatom assemblages. I want to point out that TP vector right there, and that just indicates that phosphorus is a factor that strongly influences diatom assemblages across the Big Cypress. Finally, just to summarize what we learned from the current uh, Big Cypress water quality, we saw that diatom assemblages are dominated by highly oligotrophic indicator taxa, that are unique to the low phosphorus marshes of the Everglades. Paraffite and mat total phosphorus concentrations and diatom taxa in the Big Cypress are suggestive in of enrichment at some stations, especially in that very northwestern corner of the preserve. Finally, I'm just gonna take you very quickly through a few key findings from our work comparing Big Cypress diatoms and paraffitin with Everglades uh, diatoms and paraffitin. So here we're looking at uh, paraffitin from the SFC and diatom data set from the Big Cypress National Cone Reserve and comparing that what we know from the CERT map diatom data set from the Everglades Protection Area, which have been more intensively studied. Um, you might hear me referring to the Everglades Protection Areas as just the Everglades or the EPA for short. I'm just going to hop right into our major results since we're short on time. Here I have another NMDS plot that visualizes the Big Cypress diatom assemblages in red and the Everglades diatom assemblages in blue. And I again have the environmental effectors that are associated with the diatom assemblages overlaying. So two points I want to make here. The first is that you can see a big overlap of the assemblages on the NMDS plot. This indicates that the Big Cypress and the Everglades have similar diatom assemblage composition. The next thing I want to point out is that you can see that really long vector on the right here that is total phosphorus. And this is telling us that assemblage composition in both regions is heavily influenced by phosphorus. The next thing we did is compare diatom taxa, paraffite, and mat total phosphorus optimum between the two regions. In other words, we're comparing at what phosphorus concentration each taxon reaches its highest abundance. Um, this is one method we're using to try to understand if diatom assemblages from each region respond similarly to phosphorus. We conducted a linear regression to compare uh, the relationship between the two regions. So here on the x-axis, I have Everglades diatom taxa phosphorus optimum 
And on the y-axis, I have Big Cypress, Diatom Taxid, Phosphorus Optimum, both on a log scale. That black dashed line indicates a one-to-one -one line. So if we see the points fall along there, that means the optimum are similar between the two regions. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, we found that the diatom taxa phosphorus optimum are similar between the two regions. And this indicates that both the diatoms from both regions respond similarly to phosphorus. Finally, um, this is my last result I'll present. Uh, we took this optimum that we calculated in the last slide and used them to create diatom weighted averaging models. So here we are using the Everglades as the training data set and the Big Cypress as the prediction data set. So in other words, we're using the optimum for the Everglades diatoms to see if it can predict paraphyton phosphorus in the Big Cypress. So here along the x-axis, we have observed paraphyton map total phosphorus for the Big Cypress. On the y-axis, we have the inferred values that we got using the models. And what we found is the diatom inference models created using the EPA assemblages can predict the Big Cypress paraphyton map total phosphorus concentrations with quite reasonable accuracy with an R-squared of 0.40. Um, this is once again indicating to us that assemblages from both regions respond similarly to phosphorus. So last, just to summarize what we learned from our comparison of the Big Cypress to the Everglades, uh, we found that phosphorus is a critical driver of paraphyton and diatom assemblages in the Big Cypress. Uh, we found similar responses in the Big Cypress to other better study areas of the Everglades. With that, I'd like to just thank all the help we've gotten along the way for this project, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Questions from the committee? Go ahead, Margaret. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, what, how much data did you have for the total phosphorus and what kind of frequencies were those? What kind of data was that? If you can describe it a little more. Can you repeat your question, Margaret? How much data did you have while you working with on the total phosphorus numbers you showed for? Uh, 1990 to 2011, and what kind of frequency was that for the data? If you could describe that oh, data. For the, uh, the frequency, um, I'm gonna just go back to the slide you're referring to here. Oop, where I got a little delay. That's a good question. I'll have to look, I would have to look into that more. Um, I. This may, this is USGA study, but USGS study, I believe it may have come from the district um, database, in which case they, they're sampling all of those, um, all their stations at different frequencies. But that's a good question. I'll have to look into that further. You, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jeff and then Philip. So I realize you're you're only um, only sampling where there is paraphyton, but um, I mean, Big Cypress has some pretty different habitats. Do you see any effect of um, how close you are to some of those habitats, or any of them possibly like a, a place that some extra phosphorus might come from? Like near, you know, there's a lot of pine in there, a lot of pine ridges and things. Like if there are any like sources like that, or if it just doesn't seem to be any effect of what, what else is around, because there's a lot of those edges out there. Yeah. Can you, can you go to a mic? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, 
the um, <clears throat> Big Cypress is an incredible mosaic of habitats. Um, and indeed, the sampling is done in the uh, uh, marsh habitat that is supportive of parapite. Um, we were zeroing in on that to understand the water quality of those marshes, of the most vulnerable kinds of areas of the system. Um, Jim Stevenson is our collaborator on this work. He's up at University of Michigan and has been supported through SFNRC to collect the data from that Northwestern region. And he's looking for exactly that not just gradients relative to canals, but gradients relative to uh, those kinds of pumps that we know exist in these habitats, which is, you know, when you get close to a tree island, often you do see a halo of enrichment around that just because those trees are able to tap in and, and draw it into themselves. Um, and, and so I think there's probably more uh, resolution to come on that. It's a good question. <clears throat> Philip. Philip Dixon. Um, nice talk. Hi, um, if I, I'm sort of stepping back a little bit and thinking about why you might want to measure periphyton if you're interested in trying to understand uh, surface water phosphorus concentrations, which is what the water quality concerns are all about. And I wonder if, is it true? that the periphyton, in fact, integrate um, spatially or temporally rather variable water concentrations? Are they long enough lived, or, or not dynamic enough, so that they might represent three or six month um, moving averages of water concentrations? Hi, Phil. Um, yeah, that's the, the main... Um you know, really wonderfully desirable feature of periphyton. Not only are these communities out there absorbing the phosphorus that comes to them um, and therefore creating a water column that isn't reflective of what is coming in often, um, but they also are doing this over a period of time, retaining that phosphorus in their, in their, we use the word tissue sometimes, but these these are algae and they don't have tissues technically, but they, they retain that nutrient in, in the periphyte mat. And, um, and so the kinds of uh, variability that might exist from day to night and from day to day uh, that you, that's so hard to capture unless you have an auto sampler, you know, um, distributed, you know, many of them distributed throughout the system. Um, the periphyton can give us an integrated picture of what's happened over the last few months. That's just so hard to capture in actual water quality data, uh, given that the signal is actually there and often it's not in the water data itself. Go ahead, Charlie. Think so proceed. So um, I would suggest that you probably want to get data on the water concentrations in areas where there are no periphyton. Um, if you're going to try to use the periphyton as an indicator of water, because I imagine that there are things other than phosphorus that determine the occurrence. <laughs> excuse, me. <laughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from the flu. Um, there are things other than the phosphorus concentrations that determine whether or not you'll find periphyton in an area. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that is our next step in this uh, park funded project is to uh, play around with that experimentally in the, in the lab um, and try to understand the other factors that might be um, influencing both the uh, presence of periphyton, its abundance, its species, and the amount of phosphorus it might have. Um, mainly the vectors that Kelsey was showing, hydrology and um, and pH, those two are often um, highly regulatory of, of what is uh, what you see in the, in the parabite. Thanks. So I had a couple of questions, but first, uh, thank you. It was a very nice talk. So uh, the, the first one was sort of following up on uh, what Evelyn said about what is the pH angle? Why is there a response 
to to pH? What's the the mechanism behind that? And the second question is, we have looked at different forms of phosphorus, so soluble reactive phosphorus, organic dissolved phosphorus, and particulate phosphorus. So presumably, periphyton are responsive to soluble reactive phosphorus, but are they also able to tap these other forms? Do we know anything about the bioavailability of those forms? Can you speak to that, that at all? Um, the pH question is a really good one. We see really strong gradients um, from uh, the water conservation area one on down south um, in periphyton attributes driven by the very strong pH gradients that exist in the rest of the Everglades. And out in Big Cyprus, we definitely have these acidic water communities occurring um, alongside more calcareous forming communities. Um, and that acidity can be driven by a number of different things, including the substrate and the plant community type and the, and the soils around there. And um, so that is one interaction we're really interested in. Diatoms respond really predictably and strongly to pH gradients. Um, interestingly, in the work that Kelsey's done, I think you're finding that the pH effect is very different from the uh, phosphorus effect. And so the species that like low pH um, are going to be different from those that like low P and, and vice versa. Um, so uh, we, and we do have some understanding of that, given that these are the same communities as we've studied um, deeply across, for instance, the acidic Loxahatchee down through the more calcareous Everglades. So we kind of know what those different diatoms are that like, like those different conditions. Um, the second question is a really good one, and we're just starting to really appreciate the fact that these different forms of phosphorus that might be out there um, would have a different influence, perhaps, um, have differing abundances and influence, perhaps, on on the biota. Um, you know, periphyton includes lots of it, it's algae and diatoms, but it's also a ton of bacteria. And those bacteria include species that send out uh, enzymes into the water, like you've heard about. I mean, you know about al alkaline phosphatase that can break down complex organic molecules um, and get the phosphorus out of it, both for themselves and if they're throwing that enzyme out into the community, uh, that can benefit the algae as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a great question. We haven't delved into that a ton yet, but I'm kind of looking forward. I have a new collaboration with Sue Newman at the district who loves doing that kind of thing. We've just been talking about uh, playing around with that. So, Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to Western Everglades Restoration Plan, an update. We have several presenters. Um, on this topic, and we're going to start with Steve Baston. Um, he's going to give us detailed project objectives and explain final proposed project features. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, are you going to be pulling up the presentation, or okay, or do I need to share it? I think you need to share it because we don't have a copy, as far as I know. No. All right. Um... <clears throat> Are you able to see the presentation? No, we're no. seeing your Zoom screen. Okay. I'm not as versed with Zoom. Um, let's see, share screen. Here we go, here we go. How about now? Yes, thank you. If you can make it full Fantastic. screen. Fantastic, okay. Thank you all very much. Hey, good afternoon, sorry about that. 
Uh, Steve Basden, project manager for the Western Everglades Restoration Project. Um, as with many uh, SERP projects, the, the objective of the objectives of the Western Everglades Restoration Project is to get the water right, the quality, the quantity, the timing, and the distribution of the water. So with WERP, uh, we want to kind of remove some of those impediments to the, to the natural flow of water uh, to uh, restore those freshwater flow paths, reconnect uh, ecological areas, um, and restore groundwater levels. Uh, and the restoration of those groundwater levels will help with the um, reduction uh, and the, of the frequency and the intensity of the wildfires uh, in the area, and particularly in the Big Cypress. Um, and then the last objective, of course, is to uh, reduce the phosphorus loads in the, in the water column. Uh, backing up just a little bit, of course, the study area is a large study area. It's uh, approximately 1,200 square miles. Uh, the size of Rhode Island, and uh, it's fairly unique. It does have two uh, Indian reservations within the footprint. The one, uh, the one that's kind of oriented horizontally, kind of orange uh, polygon, is the Seminole Tribe of Florida um, Big Cypress Reservation, and then the uh, vertically oriented polygon that's light green is the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida. Uh, Indian Reserve, Alligator Alley Reservation. Uh, okay, so uh, moving forward with the um, tentatively selected plan uh, as that has been released in our uh, draft project implementation report and environmental impact statement. Uh, it's alternative HNFR, which stands for the Hybrid Natural Flow Revised uh, and uh, kind of uh, how do we going to achieve those objectives? And I'll kind of highlight some of the, the, I think one of the asks was uh, what was the tribe's initial request in terms of the features for the project. So uh, again, to the restoration of the natural flow pass, we have over here, uh, the yellow polygon is the North Feeder stormwater treatment area. Uh, that will help uh, lower the nutrients from the water in the uh, north feeder basin. Uh, that water will be collected here and then um, sent through the uh, L3, ultimately in the northwest corner of Water Conservation Area 3A. So uh, one of the requests from the Seminole Tribe was to uh, reroute the water, or route the water around the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And then um, over here in the West Feeder Basin, uh, we're plugging the Wingate Mill Canal and the Lard Can Canal, uh, portions of it, uh, and in order to restore the natural flow path, uh, allow water to flow into the headwaters of the Kissimmee Billy Slough, which is right here at the um, western edge of the uh, Big Cypress Seminole Reservation. Um, where there will be a culvert there, a gated culvert, uh, and we're going to allow them to utilize their indigenous knowledge uh, in the operations of that culvert. That was another thing that they had requested. And so um, returning the flow pass, these two areas here, the water currently goes through the L28 interceptor and ultimately discharges down here in the uh, Miccosukee tribe of Indians uh, Alligator Alley Reservation. So um, these canals uh, do, do drain the areas very well, uh, and in particular in the dry season, uh, where they can reach up to upwards of uh, two to three miles away, uh, kind of lowering that groundwater level. So again, if we reduce or eliminate those effects from the canals, the drainage of those canals, then it will help raise the water levels uh, back up. And so one of the other key uh, requests from this Miccosukee tribe is to backfill this triangle area here, which is formed by the L28 interceptor and the L28 north canals and I-75 that kind of bisects the site right here. Um, 
over the years, uh, you know, the water that's been coming down here has been, and this terminus is down here, and it has affected uh, at least 5,000 acres of uh, vegetation down here. Uh, it is now mostly cattail and willows. Uh, so that's one of the other main uh, requests from the Miccosukee tribe is to uh, restore that, that area as well as eliminate the effects that, that's caused the, the change in the vegetation. Uh, and of course, with that change in the vegetation, uh, there's very limited wildlife uh, within that uh, cattail and willow area. And there's a, you can't really necessarily see it on this particular map, but there is a, an historic tree island, the McCormick's tree island, which was a very culturally significant, important uh, site to the, to the Miccosukee tribe. Uh, so we're going to restore an upland area here, uh, reconnect that area um, with their, again, some advice of their indigenous knowledge to help to support that and restore the vegetation the right vegetation. Uh, and then the request, another request was while we're plugging these canals, if we could kind of create some, some little bit higher ground uh, within those plugs to provide some high water uh, refugia for the wildlife during uh, extreme events. Um, so again, we wanna to try to remove those um, impediments, reconnect this ecological area here, the triangle area. Uh, and then we also have culverts down here. This is the L28 South. Uh, these are three gated culverts here. And these are gonna be, these, this will allow water to go in both directions. Uh, however, the tendency is for the water to accumulate here down here in the um, Southwest corner of water conservation area 3A uh, so predominantly it will bring water from 3A into the Big Cypress National Preserve. And then we also have culverts. We're, we're adding culverts to 11 Mile Road, uh, Tamiami Trail here. That's the, the southernmost uh, light blue line that's coming across the page. Uh, and Loop Road here. Uh, we're adding culverts along those three roads uh, to help convey the additional water. And then uh, lastly, I guess we had the, the maintaining the flood water to avoid the impacts to the, to the built infrastructure. And so it kind of highlighted some of the key points um, for the, the project, again, is to rehydrate the Western Everglades, uh, mostly through groundwater uh, and to avoid some of the unnatural over drainage uh, and in particular in the dry season. Um, so we wanted to uh, increase the hydration of the Kissimmee Billy Slough uh, by creating a more natural flowway in that area. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing is that, again, the groundwater levels, to increase the groundwater levels. And note that um, the, the water levels, groundwater and surface water, uh, will not be increased above the natural ecological ranges. Uh, for that diverse mosaic habitat uh, that we kind of discussed earlier. So in other words, it will be within the range of the cypress domes or the, or the pine islands, pine hammocks, um, et cetera. So with that, I've got a, the last slide I have here, uh, pending any questions. There's just kind of a, a how, what's the timeline? So as mentioned, we did, we will, we reached the, the tentatively selected plan back in August and we've uh, released the draft project implementation report and environmental impact statement uh, last month. Uh, that is undergoing uh, agency technical review, independent external peer review, and our legal and policy compliance review, as well as public review. And those public comments are due uh, the 29th of January. And our next milestone will be our agency decision milestone, uh, which would then lead us to a final uh, project implementation report in June, uh, where it will culminate in a chief's report in September of 2024, uh, where that, then it will be uh, eligible or we will enable it to be authorized in the 
uh, next Water Resources Development Act, in particular, if we have one in 2024. Um, so that, that's all I had uh, pending any questions. And we, I guess we're, next we're gonna move into, uh, we do have a couple more presentations on the Western Everglades where we'll get into the hydrology, expected hydrology uh, next. So uh, any questions on the uh, features, um, draft report, timeline, uh, et cetera. Any uh, questions from the committee? So you mentioned um, a little about vegetation, but al almost everything was hydrologic. Are there any objectives that are more focused on biology and ecology or, you know, vegetation issues? Um, you know, I think that when you're right, most of it is hydrology. And I guess once we get the water right, uh, it, it will, uh, I guess, improve the vegetation. Um, other than the removal, there are two areas that we're doing some vegetation restoration. The one was down there on the triangle that I showed you. The other was uh, up along S, near S40 up here. Uh, both are within the uh, Miccosukee uh, Reservation, the big Alligator Alley Reservation. But I'm not aware of any other specific uh, objectives to for vegetation, but I think we do have Melissa Masudi will be after Walter and she may be better um, versed at answering that question. Yeah, this is Walter. The next two parts of the presentation, we'll go through hydrology and then the ecology because the objectives are tied to the performance measures, which are ecologically based. Thank you, Walter. Do you have he has them, so or at least he has mine. So, so. I, I have them. Yes, I can. I can. I can run the show. Can you make it bigger? Can you hit that little screen share at the bottom? Sometimes that causes wackiness to happen. Presentation, presentation mode, thank you. Well, that little screen yeah, down there, yeah, that try that one. Yeah, that doesn't usually work. <laughs> I've tried that in the past. So. Bad thing um, happens. Or if you hit that in PowerPoint, go to slideshow full screen. Oh, up above. Center, top center. Oh, slideshow. Yep. Okay. Oops. Look on that full screen. From current slide. Over Is that what it says? Front current? Yeah. No. That one? No. <laughs> Which one is it? What, what, what is Which it? one is it? One from, from second the left from, from the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. One. Good. Try it. Hey. <laughs> All right. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Excellent, Steve. Uh, any more questions? No, I, I think we'll go on to uh, Walter. Thanks very much. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. All right, so Steve, I'll just say next slide when we get there. So I'm, I'm Walter Wilcox from the Inter Interagency Modeling Center and the South Florida Water Management District. Um, I'm going to go relatively quick because I know that we're a little behind on the schedule and I've been drinking a lot of coffee. So if I'm talking too fast, please slow me down. Um, when we talk about restoring natural flow paths, um, I guess I just wanted to give you a feel for what that looks like from a hydrologic perspective. And then Melissa Nasuti will come in and, and tie that back to the ecology and the landscape performance uh, subsequent to my portion of the presentation. Um, so the one thing that we've learned as part of this project, the work project has been going on for you know probably close to a decade now. Um, I, I think it, we call it Western Everglades and it's kind of tempting to think of it very much like the Everglades, but it really is a very unique landscape. Um, it's got a mosaic landscape where there's a mix of different uh, landscape types within a very small area, even within one model cell. Um, and in addition to that, this area, uh, early in the project, we were actually looking at connections to the Northern part of the system to Lake Okeechobee to the C43 Clusahatchee area. Um, it turns out that none of that kind of regional import of water was necessary to achieve the hydrologic benefits in this part of the system. So it's very much the mindset of WERP is to restore the natural flow paths, remove the effects of built infrastructure like levees and uh, canals, and really return it to a, a mosaic rain-driven system. Um, and so that's what you're going to kind of see in this hydrology. 
So we started with some of the modeling work. This is the natural system regional simulation model. It just kind of shows, and I wanted to highlight here on the, on the graphics that, again, unlike the Everglades, which is kind of persistently long hydro period wet all the time, um, in this part of the system on the, on the right side of the graphic, you can see that during the wet season, there is what we would call quote unquote surface water flow. And on the, the left side of the graphic during the dry season, there's much less surface water movement through the system. Um, but I do want to caution you all that when you hear the discussion about surface water and groundwater, um, especially at the scale that we're talking about, um, it's, a, it's not a one size fits all, right? There are depressional portions of the landscape that will stay wet most of the year, all of the year, and there will be water moving through the landscape through those areas. Uh, there's other portions of the landscape that are more like a wet prairie or uh, even, you know, upland flatwoods and things where the hydro periods are very short and they don't really um, get wet even during the wettest times. Um, so you have to be a little careful as you're looking at this model data and as you're looking at the, the performance of the plan to kind of make sure that you're referencing yourself to which landscape you're, you know, you're standing in because uh, it might be surface water in the area adjacent to you and groundwater in the area that you're standing. In. So, um, so if you go to the next slide, Steve. So just big picture to give you an idea of some of the flows. Do you, do you mind advancing? There we go. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> So in addition to the models, um, we, we have been trying to gather information from this portion, you know, from scientists, from landowners in this portion of the system. Um, you've already heard from some of the landowners today. I think we're trying to improve the communication and get more information um, as unfortunately near the end of this project, but <laughs> trying to get as much as we can um, into the work that we're doing. Um, on the left, you can see another example of some of the information that we've used. Uh, this is the West Feeder portion of the basin that, that is uh, probably still the most contentious part of the project. Um, you can see that the west feeder is kind of the yellow triangle on the far left. The north feeder is the triangle kind of in the middle. Um, and then that's just north of the Seminole Tribes uh, Big Cypress Reservation. Um, and so this map on the left is an aerial photography uh, image from the 1940s-ish. And um, what we've imposed on there is some of these blue lines that show areas that are depressed, you know, that kind of illustrate depressional areas within the aerial photography. And those locations were kind of, were confirmed by looking at some of the soil characteristics in the area. So where there were hydric soils, we kind of drew the lines where the, the blue uh, traces kind of, you know, mimic those paths of what appear to be aerially, you know, water flow points and kind of confirmed by the hydric soils. And so what you can see is that in the in the graphic on the right, today's system is drained through essentially one connected canal system and it all goes down the L-20 interceptor. And in contrast, the area on the left had a number of different you know, pathways for the water to move. And so again, the mindset of connecting natural flow paths that WERP is operating under, you can see on the right, there's a comparison between the blue volumes, which are the current flow volumes uh, as simulated by the regional model over uh, the 1965 through 2005 uh, climate rainfall period. And then contrasting that to the orange, uh, tags, which is what Western uh, is proposing in its alternative, uh, tentatively selected plan alternative. And you can see that in the current system, all of the flow essentially shows up at the, the L-20 interceptor and moves down the system. It's kind of drained you know, through that area. And in Western, we're distributing that flow across multiple points uh, of entry into the downstream system. So some portion of it is diverted to the east uh, in the, into the C-139 annex from the north feeder, 29,000 acre feet. Um, there's still some water going down into the L-20 interceptor, even though that area is backfilled. So there's still water uh, moving from the Big Cypress Reservation um, into the Big Cypress National Preserve. Um, and then on the left side of the graphic is uh, kind of the area that you'll hear a lot of discussion about with the Kissimmee Billy Slough, Kissimmee Billy Strand, um, the, the diversion of water into that portion of the system. And you can see it's 18,000 acre feet. So contrast that to, you know, low car and hundreds of thousands of acre feet. It's not a giant volume of water, but it is very significant to that landscape. So if you keep going, Steve. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and just go through the end. I think there's some text if you click a couple more times. Didn't mean to leave that on. Um, yeah, that's good, thanks. Uh, so the graphics that you see here are um, taking the regional simulation model data and imposing it on the best digital elevation model that we do have um, at, a, at a much finer resolution than what the regional model actually simulates. Um, and so these graphics were generated to try to give an idea of what we're seeing within that mosaic. So sometimes our regional tools are you know, kind of aggregated at a very high level and it's very difficult for people to understand what they're predicting and how they're being used. Not so much from the performance measure perspective that the projects are using, but from kind of a understanding what's happening on the ground perspective. So these graphics were designed to kind of illustrate some of the changes. And what you see is the yellow coloration in these plots 
Uh, this is a one-day snapshot from the regional simulation model. Um, the yellow in the plots is kind of close to the ground surface in that, those localities. And then as you move to, you know, toward the reds, you're basically moving below ground surface. And as you're moving toward the greens and eventually the blues, you're moving into uh, water levels that are above ground surface in that particular location. And so you can see that the work project in contrast to the existing condition, um, there are areas where the conditions are getting significantly wetter. Um, you can see in the project's flowway, um, which is on the left side of the graphic, where, kind of where the Wingate Mill and the Lard Can Canal intercept the West Feeder Canal. You can see there's a big area of green and yellow. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that's an area that we're looking at in more detail. That's where the backfill of the canals is currently proposed. Um, and then you can see in the L-28 interceptor where the canal ends, uh, in the vicinity of Looneyville that was mentioned earlier, you can see that there's a large increase in uh, green compared to the existing condition where the canal is kind of drying down um, and creating that red swath that moves uh, down through the system because of its drainage effect. Um, so by you know, removing these uh, pathways that are collecting water and kind of over draining the system and putting that water back into the natural flow paths, the, uh, the attempt is to try to create a restored ecosystem in those areas and to improve the function of those ecosystems, uh, both for the local areas within the Seminole Tribes native area and also in the Big Cypress National Preserve. So if you go to the next slide, Steve. Um, this is just the dry season. So the first graph we were looking at was kind of like the end of the uh, wet season, you know, kind of end of the tropical season, and this is closer to the end of the dry season. Again, you can see the, the predominant red characteristics here, where basically everything is kind of moved significantly below ground because of, again, just the rainfall driven nature and the shorter hydro period uh, landscapes that are identified here. Next slide. So, in the southern portion of the system, it's kind of the same idea. Um, in this case, uh, as Steve mentioned, we're removing a lot of the levees and canals that. Um, are currently breaking up the system. Oops, sorry, go back one more. Um, so just to give you an idea again of the flow volumes across that L28 South in the current system, there are some structures that currently exist and there's some flow moving from Conservation Area 3 into the uh, Big Cypress National Preserve um, in the vicinity of US 41. Um, but Western Everglades is increasing that conveyance and allowing more water to move through the system in that direction for Lossman Slough and Dayoff Slough and some of the other areas uh, downstream. Um, and so you can see that increase in flow again is you know, relatively small in SERP volumes, but important for this part of the landscape, about 30,000 acre feet on an average annual basis. And yeah, you can go to the next one, Steve. And so again, looking at the same kind of graphics for the end of the wet season in this part of the system, you'll notice there's not a lot of difference in most places, like the high water conditions are really not that changed. Um, but you can see that in the vicinity of the L28 South on the right side of these graphics, you can see the increased connectivity as the blues and greens start moving over closer to the Western footprint. Um, and you can see that's kind of where the canal backfill has been um, implemented in the L28 South Canal. And if you just click through, I think there's a couple notes that say what I just said, and then go to the next slide and look at uh, the end of the dry season in April, if we can get the text on there. Um, this one's a little more dramatic. You can see that the you know, the extension of the water flow into the area upstream of US 41 and then past US 41 uh, further south into the system is kind of seen in the water levels. Again, the volumes aren't that large, the, the absolute changes in water depths aren't that large, uh, but they are meaningful in terms of fire prevention and some of the performance measures that Melissa will take you through um, in the next portion of the slide. So the next slide. And I just included these links. If you wanna to go to these links, you can go and see a daily animation of 10 years. You can see what's happening in dry years, what's happening in wet years, the seasonal patterns. And these have been made available to the public as well for uh, people to kind of dig into the detail uh, in, if they want to. Next slide. And so this is my last slide. I think I just want to acknowledge that um, there's a very important conversation being had right now with the landowners, with the public about uh, kind of how this project is landing. We have a draft uh, PIR on the street. Um, but in particular, in the northwest portion of the area, there's still a lot of concerns about what the project is proposing and how that's affecting the system. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're communicating well and improving the communication. Um, we're trying to explain what the modeling tools are currently doing. Um, like, for example, we're accounting for uh, lateral flows from the Ocala Gucci Slough um, that a lot of people you know, thought weren't in the regional assessment. Um, but there's still a lot of questions about the data, the model fidelity, are we looking at things in the right way? So that conversation is ongoing. You've heard some of that today. We wanna to have that conversation. We're having open houses where 
continuing the conversation over the next couple months. Um, and one of the things that the project is going to be doing is expediting um, some of the development of some of the more detailed tools that would typically happen in the engineering design phase to try to look at what specific features are most effective at achieving the water movement um, in this northwest portion of the system to achieve the ecosystem response that we're looking for, but also not you know, flood the natural or the built environment. And so that's an ongoing conversation that's kind of critical to how the, the Western project is gonna land. And just, I'll just point out the last graphic there. The, the, the graph on the bottom in the center um, on the left is kind of the actual landscape. On the right is how the regional model sees it. So you can kind of get an idea of the aggregated scale that we're working at. It's you know pretty aggregated. And so when we look at graphics like on the right, which is the ponding depth in the regional model, that blue swap that you see in the lower left portion of that graph is the Kissimmee Billy Slough, and that's moving down, you know, through the culvert that's been mentioned a couple of times into the Seminole Tribe area, and also moving further south toward Big Cypress. Um, but again, at the scale of the model, when you look at that, you say, oh, it's half a foot higher, a foot higher. What that really means on the landscape is different in a cypress dome. It doesn't mean that there's a foot of additional water on a pine flatwood. You know, you have to kind of dig into it a little bit more, and Melissa will take you through some of that. So I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa Nasuti for the ecology piece. I think probably the two go together. So if you can keep going, that would, okay. Mia, just Hi. a quick question. Right, Melissa, hold on just a second. Um, the, the water budget arrow pictures, yep. I was trying to figure out if those were additive or if, so you had like 19 or 18 more from the top and then you sort of had 30 more coming in from the northeast or the eastern side, it, right. does that 18 curve around and contribute to the 30 or is, it, is it, that measured in a different spot and they're both? No, it, it does. The, the way that the system works, if you actually go down, so the 18 that's coming in on the north, um, if you go further down uh, to the two slides or three slides, Steve, to the next one that has the arrows on it, um, the way that this portion of the system works is there's an area called Mull Slough. So do you see where there's the gap between the built infrastructure, the canals right now in the, in the underlying graphic? That's kind of the low area of topography. And so most of the water that gets captured north and west of that actually comes into the Everglades on the western side into 3A. And so some of that 30,000 that, that's coming back around, some of it is watered from the northern part of Big Cypress and some of it is water that would otherwise be in the central Everglades. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so my question is on the RSM digital elevation model results. Yep. So the predictions look relatively localized as far as the the outcomes um, relative to these big projects. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that's cumulative effects after multiple wet dry seasons, multiple years, or is it just like daily differences? So the simulation model is daily. And then what I'm showing you in most of the graphics is some kind of high level aggregate, like for example, the average annual ponding difference. So that's across the entire period of simulation, how much difference is there in water level? But the performance measures actually, depending on the performance measure, look at specific times of year or timing or return frequency to calculate what that really means for the ecosystem. So there's vegetation performance measures, there's fire risk performance measures. Those have an increased level of fidelity in how they're calculated. Um, it's all based on the daily simulation data. Thank you. Okay, Melissa. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, so for my portion of today's presentation, I'm gonna provide a very broad overview of how alternatives were evaluated during plan formulation, as well as touch upon some of the benefits of WARP that you've actually heard um, in the prior two presentations from Steve and um, Walter. Um, so this slide here, depict steps that were taken to evaluate alternatives within the work draft PIR and EIS. So the first thing that the team had to do was develop predictive performance measures and targets. Um, we have project performance measures within Water Conservation Area 3 and Everglades National Park as a result of prior planning studies, but we did not have that for this effort. So we developed an eco sub team and developed those performance measures 
that were tied back to the Big Cypress conceptual ecological model. Um, each project performance measure was tied back to a specific project objective as well. Um, and when we developed them, they were reviewed by Recover for consistency with SERP. Um, as well as the CORE's National Ecosystem Restoration Planning Center of Expertise. Um, in step two, um, we had development of the hydrologic models as Walter alluded to. Those regional hydrologic models served as the basis to give us that predictive performance measure output. And then we had to develop a planning model where we aggregated the results of those project performance measures into a habitat suitability scores, which were then applied across the project area to obtain habitat units. Um, and so as several of the pa panel members probably know, habitat units are sort of the, the main metric that we use to justify selection of an ecosystem restoration plan. But within our NEPA documents, we also utilize whatever is available to us to try and describe potential effects on the environment. So we also use some tools um, from the Joint Ecosystem Modeling Group within USGS um, that were applicable to the Western Everglades, um, specifically some of their wading bird tools um, because of the, the Fertile Crescent area and potential effects on wading birds in the southern part of the study area. Um, next slide. So this just contains a list of the project performance measures that were developed. Um, as I've said, they, they, are, they were similar to those um, that were used within other CERP planning study area, or CERP studies, excuse me, for Water Conservation Area 3 and Everglades National Park, but we, we basically had to tailor them to the Western Everglades. So in general, project performance measures looked at you know, above and below ground water levels, duration of those water levels, frequency of water levels. But we looked at things like ecological connectivity, inundation patterns, sheet flow, um, fire risk, which Walter mentioned. Um, we worked with the prior hydrologists for Big Cypress to specifically look at the amount of time that water was below half a foot and a foot and a half below ground, um, because those were felt to represent sort of um, a risk for um, moderate and severe fire um, within the Western Everglades. And within Water Conservation Area 3 in Everglades National Park, there's a well-known recover performance measure that looks at hydrologic suitability for slough vegetation. Well, within the Western Everglades, you have various vegetation types such as um, marl prairies, cypress, pine flatwoods. So we actually developed a new um, vegetation communities performance measure that had specific thresholds related back to the specific hydrologic requirements that are needed to maintain those types of, of vegetation. And then we looked at how those changes in hydrology that Walter mentioned affected the, the various mosaic of vegetation communities across the study area. Um, because Water Conservation Area 3 in Everglades National Park is adjacent and we're affecting the water budget there, we looked at those performance measures as well for slough vegetation suitability and soil oxidation. Um, and then we did have one performance measure that looked at uh, total phosphorus downstream of the L28 interceptor and S140. Um, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we developed a planning model. Um, we had several performance measures. Each performance measure had several submetrics, um, but we needed a way to aggregate those results, apply them across the study area um, to generate a habitat suitability index, and then multiply that by the acreage to get um, a habitat unit. Um, so this slide just depicts within the regional hydrologic model that was developed for the project, um, we delineated these zones, um, which were essentially watersheds based on coordination with the eco sub team um, and Big Cypress National Preserves hydrologist to basically evaluate when you apply those project performance measures within these zones, how did the um, 
performance measure results differ dependent upon the alternative um, that you evaluated. And this basically enabled us to see sort of how the, the individual project performance or once you aggregated um, those project performance measures into one habitat suitability score, you know, how performance differed across the project area in, in different portions under different alternatives that had, you know, slightly different um, features. Next slide. So this is sort of a, a, a bottom line up front. Um, we have individual graphics for all the different performance measures scattered throughout the work PIR EIS, but I just included this slide in here to show the overall across all the zones that we evaluated when you look at those project performance measures collectively, inundation duration, fire risk, vegetative communities, ecological connectivity, um, you are seeing lift with work relative to the future without project condition or no action. Um, so on the left hand side of the slide, this table basically just shows the percent of target habitat units achieved on a zero to 100 scale. Um, and color is just simply used here to sort of help delineate with the eye um, if you're achieving less than 50%, between 50 to 74%, or greater than 75% of the possible benefits that you could achieve if you met the individual targets for all of those performance measures. Um, and then on the right hand slide, side of the slide, <laughs> tongue twister, um, the table just shows habitat unit lift um, relative to the future without project condition. So across the study area, we're seeing a potential improvements in terms of habitat units. And remember habitat units are reflective or a direct reflection of those project performance measures that the team developed and that I showed um, on the previous slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the team has received several comments um, pertaining to potential effects of water levels on existing vegetation throughout the study area. Um, so as I mentioned, we did develop a specific performance measure, which evaluated hydrologic suitability for the various vegetation communities across the Western Everglades, including Cypress, Marl Prairie, um, Mesic Pine Flatwoods. Um, due to the time that we had today, I just included um, two example slides um, as sort of a, a uh, a, a takeaway. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so these next two slides sort of focus in that area of concern um, that has been mentioned by stakeholders and that Walter alluded to. Um, and these two slides were actually shown at an open house that we did within the December timeframe. Um, so they show how water levels may affect existing vegetation, specifically within the flowway that's located directly south of the West Feeder Canal. Um, that is shown on the left-hand side of the slide within the um, white circle. Um, so within the middle of the slide, basically the left and the center diamonds represent how hydrologic conditions are expected to change under the current condition and with WERP. And then the right diamond represents basically the ecological range. And this is just an example within the flowway for tall cypress. And on the very right hand side of the slide, you can see um, horizontal lines that depict various water depths at which may be a too wet condition for that type of habitat or a severely dry condition. Um, <clears throat> so with respect to tall cypress habitats, the objective really is to try and improve hydro periods and minimize um, the dry out risk with respect to, to fire or crown fires. So the takeaway from this slide is that within this area, and this is just one example, um, as Walter said, we will uh, remain within the ecological range for tall cypress and we're you know, benefiting you can see at that lower level where the area might become a little bit too dry and the risk for fire, damaging fires is a little bit higher. 
um, with work. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, keep going. Sorry, I said sort of what was in the animations. <laughs> um, so the next slide um, shows a seasonal hydrograph where water levels are shown throughout the year. Um, once again, you can go ahead and click. There's animation for this as well, Steve. There we go. Um, once again, uh, water levels for the current condition are shown sort of in that turquoise line, and then with work are shown within that dark blue line. And then on the vertical axis are those elevation conditions that were shown on the previous slide, which represent once again, the ecological range for tall cypress, conditions that are very wet, typically wet, typically dry, or severely dry. And once again, this is sort of concentrating within that flowway area that we've talked about today. Um, but the, the take home is that we will increase groundwater elevation um, relative to the current condition, as well as um, increase wet season above groundwater, but we're still within that ecological condition. So the expectation is that based on this, as well as that vegetative community's performance measure that I alluded to earlier, across the study area where we evaluated it, WERP is expected to improve hydrology and the vegetation mosaic within Big Cypress is expected to benefit. Um, next slide, please. And this is a, a take home slide that provides a summary of potential benefits expected from WERP. Um, actually, Steve alluded to some of this or stated some of this in his presentation, but in summary, um, all HNFR is expected to promote plant and animal diversity within the study area. Specifically, there's a feature to try and address some of that nuisance vegetation at the terminus of the L28 interceptor. Um, we will rehydrate um, the L28 triangle, as Steve mentioned, with respect to the, the Miccosukee by removing those man-made features. Um, reconstruction of McCormick Tree Island, and then with construction of the STA, the intent is to improve water quality and nutrient conditions. And with that improved um, hydrology and groundwater, um, that is expected to have a beneficial effect on vegetation across the study area. And then lastly, um, I just provided a very broad overview <laughs> of um, some potential benefits, but I just wanted to put, um, next slide please, Steve. I just wanted to put in a plug for the adaptive management and monitoring plan that can be found in Annex D of the work PIR and EIS. Um, so Annex D essentially outlines the monitoring that is needed to ensure that we achieve the benefits that, that we expect. Um, so it's composed of three parts. Part one is the adaptive management ecological monitoring plan. Part two is the, excuse me, I can never say this word, hydrometeorological monitoring plan. <laughs> and it's a Good job. Every single time. <laughs> Um, and part three um, is the, the water quality monitoring plan. Um, so, so specifically part one, the adaptive management and ecological monitoring plan, that is gonna identify um, the monitoring needed to document progress toward meeting the goals and objectives um, that, that Steve presented, as well as project specific uncertainties. Um, and the, the team developed uncertainties related to flora and fauna, hydrology, um, and water quality. Um, and then part two, um, the hydrometeorological monitoring plan, as I'm sure you're aware, that's basically monitoring that's needed to inform system operations. And part three um, is water quality monitoring that is requirement um, that that addresses regulatory requirements. Um, so I don't have any further slides on the adaptive management and monitoring plan other than um, I think it's a robust plan that, that several sub teams um, help to develop and we can provide further information about that or address any specific questions on that maybe at a, a future CISREP meeting. Um, so 
so that's all I have. I believe Leslie is next, but I'll take any questions. Any questions from the committee? Ramesh has a question. Ramesh, you may be Ramesh, you there. Thank you for your presentation, Melissa. I really enjoy it. Uh, I just want to know if you are including your uh, ecological monitoring. Uh, I have not heard anything about the soils, soil types. So in Annex D, that part one contains both the adaptive management and ecological monitoring plan. And I'd have to refresh my memory, but I don't think that there's any specific monitoring with respect to delineating different soil types across the project area. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I don't believe so, um, but I, I can check and if, if I'm incorrect, perhaps I can um, respond back to Stephanie at a later time. Thank you. Philip, then Margaret. So Philip Dixon, this is a con uh, follow on onto some of the questions we had earlier about um, whether or not there was budget for, for example, other agencies to do permit review. Um, monitoring can be expensive and the money is to build. Is there any forward looking um, way of incorporating money to support monitoring efforts into these projects? Or is monitoring going to have to be funded separately as possible um, after the project's completed, construction's being completed? So there's an associated, within the Adaptive Management and Ecological Monitoring Plan, as well as part two and part three, each monitoring plan should have a cost and that cost is built into the total project cost within the PIR EIS. So when the um, project is con congressionally authorized and funded, the, the monitoring cost should be built in. So it should be there um, when it is needed subject to funding constraints at the actual time and appropriations. But there is a cost um, within the monitoring plan itself to say, here's the, the outline of what we have right now and here's the cost associated with it. Does that address your question? Thank you. How many years of monitoring gets built into project budgets? What's the time frame of monitoring? Well, it varies depending upon which part of the monitoring plan that you're you're talking about. Um, the points of contact for the hydrometeorological and the water quality, I don't believe are with us today, but for the adaptive management ecological monitoring plan, it assumed uh, a yearly cost for various indicators, and then it assumed times a duration of 10 years. But how that is, is parsed out based on when construction starts or the frequency, um, but that was sort of what was assumed for the purpose of the budget within the plan itself in the PIR EIS. Margaret? Thanks for the presentation, Melissa. So with respect to restoring low nutrient conditions, what um, thresholds or targets are you working towards uh, and how did you determine those? Well, with respect to that particular performance measure, it assumed that the target would be met and then it, it basically assumed a, a benefit of so many acreage based on like if, if we were doing herbicides or um, mechanical treatment, but with respect to water quality targets, I think I'm gonna kick that question to Leslie Waugh and our Ken Bradshaw, because I don't know if that gets into sort of the regulatory realm. Um, I feel more comfortable if, if, if they would answer because it's water quality specific and that's really not my area of expertise. <laughs> 
So looking for a, a lifeline I here from other project it's, members. Leslie, if it's better to punt that until after your okay. talk, that's fine. Leslie's okay. We have a couple of questions for Melissa. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's fine. Question and answer at the end. After all this, um, it, well. it's should I little ask tight. now? No, okay. ask now. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a question, I guess, maybe about a couple of presentations, but um, in looking at work, there are some- Closer to your mic. Thank you. Uh, are some operational um, features, it seems, that would require, I guess, operational plans once constructed. And so I'm curious, when you're simulating um, alternatives, how, what do you assume for the operations when they haven't been optimized yet? And how much difference will that make in the results that you get? <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the first part. I'm not sure about the second part, but the, um, yeah. So when we make these model assumptions, we make an assumption for the operating plan that's in place and it depends on where you are in the system. So for example, um, as you saw in the ponding uh, map, the operation of the culvert on the boundary road is open in the model, right? Because that's one of the natural connections. So the assumption was that the water could flow either east or south, depending on the natural gradient. And that, that was what was built into the analysis in that location. Um, in other areas where there's uh, uh, structures that will be proposed by the project and operated by the, the district or the, the core eventually, um, we come up with a, a draft operating manual that says here is how we plan to, to operate them. Typically it's within the concept of what the Everglades calls rainfall driven operations, where it's a function of stage and rainfall conditions. We open the structures you know, with more flow during wetter times to, and, with, and we close them during drier times to kind of mimic the natural response. It doesn't mean that they're closed during droughts. It's just that the magnitude of flow through the structures is kind of tied to an estimate of what the natural hydrologic flow would have been in that location. So those are analyzed as part of the model run. And then there's a draft operating manual put into the PIR. And then later, there are many steps. There's a preliminary, there's a there's like four operating manual steps before it ever gets permitted, where those operations are revisited as the project is designed, constructed, and, and brought online. Thanks. And then go ahead. I just yep. had a, a, a related to then to adaptive management. So um, <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think, so, so this is interesting. So we have a, a draft operating plan, but it'll ultimately be operated differently, presumably um, down the road. And so then that seems to be something that's an uncertainty in some sense of what you're going to get. And so do the, when we think about an adaptive management plan and the things that we're monitoring, can that, does that feed into how you operate? or how you develop an operating plan? I think we're gonna need a tag team with Melissa on that one, but I think those are two different lanes on the same highway. Um, the operating manual has a process by which it moves forward and continues to get refined as detail and scientific uncertainty reduces, um, but it's always tied back to the original objectives of the project and what Congress authorized, right? So there's a kind of a check in that process as it moves through to try to ensure that it's achieving what, you know, what, what was identified in the PIR is what the project was trying to do. The adaptive management uncertainties are a little bit different. They're specific, there's triggering conditions. Maybe Melissa, you can talk to that side of the process because I think they're, they can also trigger action, but not in the same way uh, they, they, you know, to the operating manual revision. So, Melissa, did you have um, Yeah, so within the adaptive management plan for each uncertainty, the eco sub team drafted an adaptive management strategy and that basically should identify the monitoring information that's needed to address the uncertainty and the decision criteria or the, the trigger for which an adaptive management option should potentially be pursued. And we do have management options within the adaptive management plan that, that do suggest that perhaps we would want to um, change operations once you know, certain project components are built if the, the benefits that we expected are not being achieved. But then I think that relates back to the process for how that actually occurs. Um, because if you have a, a DPOM or a water control plan, and then a project team comes up with a suggestion to change operations based on some of the monitoring that's been done, 
then you would have to do additional things like NEPA to support a change to a water control plan. But bottom line, the adaptive management plan does suggest things with respect to uncertainties that if benefits aren't being achieved, then perhaps you would want to um, adjust operations. Okay. Does that Yeah, help? that's great. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. perfect. That's perfect. Because it does seem that that's, I mean, that's where a lot of the flexibility potentially is, is in the operations. And, and one of the great um, achievements that I think is this re-operating the system as new features come online, which is sort of this opportunity also to adapt their changing conditions and, and uncertainty that are being reduced. And to have that sort of formalized as you go forward, as you continue to learn, as conditions continue to change, um, seems like there could be great benefit to that, increasing the flexibility for increasing the flexibility of the system. I'll just add to that, that SERP has always envisioned that process that you just outlined, uh, Casey, that um, it, you hear the concept of system operating manual, particular Lake Chobe system operating manual, that system operating manual concept is that process. So when you hear the terminology in SERP evolve from water control plans to system operating manual, it's exactly that mindset that you're entering into this kind of recurring update as new information comes on the table, as features are built, as you identify scientific uncertainties, as the permitting conditions change, you have a mechanism to continue to evolve those system operations. And that was envisioned in the pro regs. Sir. Um, I was hoping, did that get you, Casey? Are you done? Yes. Sir. Okay. Um, I was hoping you could respond to some of the stakeholder concerns, which seem to be primarily in two camps. One is about flooding of residences or land, which I assume is covered by the savings clause that you can't do that. But I was wondering how you, if, if you can look at some of these inundation maps and clearly water is higher in developed areas. And then the second part is the issue about panthers. Um, you talked about vegetation shifts, but I don't know about how panthers link to vegetation and and what is the actual impact to panthers and is there mitigation? If there is mitigation, what does that involve? So Walter, I can address panthers, but I'd have to defer to another team member with yep. respect to the savings clause. Why don't you do that one and I'll hit the first one, so. Okay, yeah, so Within the draft PIR EIS, we have a biological assessment and we are consulting with the US Fish and Wildlife Service on potential effects to panthers. Um, as was stated earlier by the gentleman, we are envisioning to utilize credits from the Picking Strand Restoration Project to offset the loss of potential habitat within the footprint of the North Feeder STA. So right now we submitted a biological assessment. The US Fish and Wildlife Service is reviewing it and then they will provide a biological opinion associated with the project, um, which will basically provide concurrence with our effects determination um, on the panther. Um, we do have some information within the biological assessment that talks about um, changes in water levels across the project area and the potential impacts on the panther, specifically with respect to deer, because deer are a primary uh, prey for the panther. But um, the, the takeaway is within the work PIR EIS, while there is an impact to the panther within the footprint of the North Feeder STA, as a result of that loss of habitat elsewhere within the project area, we believe that the panther is expected to benefit based on the underlying benefit um, to vegetation and that there is not the expectation that there would be an adverse impact with respect to the, the panther and, and deer. Um, and we're also considering um, a wildlife crossing um, in the design of some of the culverts in region four um, as a, a further minimization measure. And so just to the, the first question, I, I guess the best answer I can give right now is that the conversation is still ongoing. Um, I think that it's very 
specific to the individual landowners in the specific location, how that conversation needs to uh, move forward. Um, within, I, I would say most of the discussions that are still outstanding right now are in the vicinity of the West Feeder Basin, in the Wingate Mill, the Kissimmee Billy Slough area. Um, and there are different cases there. There are, are areas that are north of the Wingate Mill, uh, further up in the West Feeder, where the project objective is clearly the savings clause don't impact people. We just haven't landed on all of the engineering design to get there. Um, there's areas within the flowway where the water is being redirected, where there's a different conversation that needs to be had with those with those landowners to identify what the, the balance point is. And, and honestly, we have some work to do as a project team to rebuild the trust and communication with those landowners, because a lot of them um, were, you know, feel like they weren't engaged early enough in the process. So that's still work that we're doing. Um, the draft EIS represents a snapshot in time, but those conversations are going to require more detailed tools and continued evolution of the plan, you know, to the final EIS before we get there. So it's not a one size fits all discussion. Um, some landowners believe that they're being impacted. We don't really see that. So we're trying to listen to them and understand why they think that there's other landowners that we know are impacted. They know that they're impacted. We have to have a conversation about what that looks like. Um, it may not be a savings clause violation, but it has to be a, a mutually agreed upon, you know, path forward, especially with a private landowner. So do you have to resolve this before it goes to Congress? I mean, is that part of the savings clause process? Or is that something, you know, sometimes you say we'll work this out in design, but where- I think that's the, the conversation we're having. I, I don't know that I have the full policy answer to that, but that's the conversation that we're having. The, the, in order to move to Congress, we, we do want to have landowner acceptability and acceptability, you know, a, a feeling of acceptability from the stakeholder community. Um, we're not there yet, so we have more work to do. That's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> Hey, Leslie. You would. So, Steve, do you want to still keep driving? Thank you. Sure. And I'll stick to my notes so I can try to get through this pretty quickly. <laughs> so I know I'm close to last here. Um, so again, my name is Leslie Wall. I'm a section administrator with the South Florida Water Management District. And um, my part of the presentation today is to talk about the WARP implementation plan. Can everybody hear me okay? So as we've seen with the um, past presentations, um, WARP is a very large plan and it has a lot of features to help restore the Western Everglades. But as we implement that plan, we want to ensure that number one, the project is not going to cause unintended hydrologic impacts and two, does not degrade any downstream environments. So to address those considerations, the Army Corps and the Water Management District developed an integrated implementation plan and identified dependencies. So there are two types of dependencies that I'll discuss with this plan. First are WERP project dependencies. So that's mostly specific to sequencing of construction. And then second are non-WERP activities. So non-WERP WERP activities are state-led nutrient source control activities on public and private lands in the feeder canal basin to help improve water quality. Next slide, please. Okay. So first I'll cover the non-WERP activities. And these are focused in the feeder canal basin. So the feeder canal basin is located at the northern end of the WERP project area. And the feeder canal basin is divided into two sub basins. So we have the north feeder canal sub basin and the west feeder canal sub basin. And the available water from these two basins contribute to the restoration flows for work. But before some project features can be constructed or operated in some cases, the implementation of the state-led non-WERP activities will need to demonstrate improved water quality for total phosphorus in those two sub-basins. So the plan provides an incremental approach to these non-WERP activities. So we'll start with some additional water quality monitoring and working with landowners to implement um, best management practices or BMPs. Um, we have a couple other projects going on in those basins as well. So we'll start with those kind of incremental approaches and then look for trends obviously in the right direction. So improved water quality specifically for total phosphorus. 
And if we don't see those going in the right direction, then we'll add on to that plan and continue with um, nutrient source control projects. And then we can also utilize um, rulemaking in those basins. So although this is an incremental approach and it's the, it's the same approach in both sub-basins, the implementation might be different in those sub-basins depending on what we see as far as water quality improvements. Next slide, Steve. Okay, so what does this mean for the WERP project? So the non-WERP dependencies are focused on water quality, and that mainly affects the features in regions one and two, the, the north end of the, of the project area. So in region one, that's uh, the North Feeder Canal Subbasin. So prior to operating the North Feeder STA and installation of a plug at the PC-17A structure, um, we'll have to demonstrate the effectiveness of the non-WARP activities with a downward trend in total phosphorus concentrations. And then in region two, the West Feeder Canal Subbasin, um, we have a total or target total phosphorus concentration that'll need to be met at the West Weir prior to uh, moving forward with the backfill of the Lard Can and the Wingate Mill Canals. And then when we talk about the work project de dependencies themselves, so that's features that depend on the sequencing of construction, and that's mostly to not cause adverse hydrologic effects in the system. So for example, um, we kind of already touched on it. So backfilling the, the triangle with the L28 interceptor canal, we would need to make sure that region one and region two are complete prior to the backfill of the L28 interceptor canal moving forward. Cause you need to make sure that those flows that went down that canal are diverted either to the Western flowway or into the um, North feeder STA. So that's where the plan then between the non-WERP and WERP dependencies become. And if you look in the um, draft PIR in section 6.7, that's where this plan is detailed. And there's also a series of tables that detail the dependencies for all the features within the project area. So just to get a little deeper in the water quality considerations for the Western flowway in region two. So a lot of parts of the work project area don't have numeric nutrient criteria for water quality standards. Um, we have narrative standards and the narrative standards state that water cannot cause or contribute to an Im imbalance of populations of natural flora and fauna in downstream environments. But for planning purposes for work specifically, for alternative evaluations and for um, plan implementation, we needed, it helps to use numbers, right? So DEP derived um, numeric interpretations of those narrative standards and placeholder targets for phosphorus concentrations. So looking at two specifically and the Western flowway. So again, we don't have numeric nutrient standards for total phosphorus, but in the PIR, we have placeholder numbers and those numbers are subject to change with additional monitoring that we will do with the project. Um, but for planning purposes, DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, derived a placeholder number of 17 parts per billion of total phosphorus in the Northern area of the Big Cypress National Park. And then if you have the assumption um, from literature review that we did, if you assume that there's an uptake of nutrients in the flowway, between 45 and 50 percent, then that give us gives us a target in the West Feeder Canal subbasin of 31 to 34 parts per billion total phosphorus that would need to move before we can move forward with backfilling the canals in that region. So that's the gist of it. That's a very high level roll up version of. The implementation plan. It is detailed, like I said, in section 6.7 of the draft EIS. Um, so if you have questions though, just let me know. So are you, are you going to do any work to test that assumption of 40 to 
five to fifty percent uptake before it reaches big cypress. Yeah, we've there's there's literature that does back that up, but we do plan to do additional monitoring in within the flowway and within Big Cypress National Park too, prior to applying for permits to do the, the project. And talk about the flowway, you're talking about the little band between build canal like lost ten. Yes. <laughs> um, and and the boundary of Big Cypress. So you're you're Correct. not worried so between about between the elevation. Wingate Mill Canal and the boundary of the Big Cypress National Park. Uh, Margaret. Okay, thanks, Leslie. So that answers some question on the target in the west area. But what about um, in the triangle area where they have also been concerned about uh, water quality? Are their targets set for those um, and the plan to achieve them for that area? It's hard. I'm sorry. It's hard to hear with that. Could you repeat that, Margaret? That way. So, what about uh, the triangle area? Um, there have been concerns there about water quality uh, coming, the, the uh, phosphorus concentrations coming through the L28 eyes. So, uh, I can now, uh, are there targets for that area too? And how have those been set? And then after that, I have another question. Right, so um, I think like, somebody can. You need to oh, recap the, the targets for the triangle area. No, I know. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yes, for the triangle. So we did, again, during the planning process, um, DEP developed those numeric nutrient criterias, um, but that's within the Miccosukee Reservation, which they do have um, targets for total phosphorus within their the boundaries of their reservation, which is, I believe, is ten parts per billion. Yes. Um, Does that but mean it has to also meet those, right? As right, but we're backfilling that area, so there won't be any necessarily any inflows, right? So if we're taking care of the inflows on the north end, so now the water that did flow down that L twenty eight I into that triangle. Some is going to be diverted into the Northwest Feeder STA and treated through the STA. And then the water that came from the West Feeder sub canal basin or canal sub basin will be again, working with those non-WARP activities, working with landowners to improve BMPs, um, including nutrient source control projects if needed, will work to reduce um, the total phosphorus in that basin to meet that uh, currently the planning target of 31 to 34 before we could implement the project there. So the, uh, um, there's a lot on the BMPs and a lot will depend on working with, I'll try and speak a little louder. There's a lot on the BMPs and a, and a lot depends on working with the landowners so what is the plan for working with the landowners and what's the monitoring plan as well to ensure um, or to evaluate the progress, uh, especially given the dependencies on that component for other work components? So the plan for like the non warp activities that we're talking about within the um, feeder canal basin. So we do have some of that information detailed in the PIR. It's in the appendix C um, are some of the specifics of that plan. But a lot of that is like a lot of the details are really under development at the moment, right? We're currently talking to landowners. We're having a lot of conversations with everyone out there. But um, what specifically is going to be implemented is still needs to be determined. Part of our question was monitoring. Oh, right. So we are in, right. So we do plan to increase the monitoring in the area. We do currently monitor at the West Weir. Um, but since the majority of the canals in that area are private, we have to continue to work with the landowners to get access to do some monitoring. So that's part of the conversations that we're having with the non-WERP activities as well. 
is to be able to have some additional access to do additional monitoring. So still all under development. Yeah, I think uh, Casey asked about adaptive management for the operations. Um, what about the plan uh, to adapt uh, depending on what kind of information you're getting with your monitoring, how, um, what's the plan and uh, how will you adapt if things are not going maybe the way you are thinking in terms of being able to bring the rest of the WAP components online? And I'm gonna see if Melissa wants to jump back on to talk about the adaptive management plan. Yeah, hi, this is um, Melissa again. So we do have a water quality uncertainty within the adaptive management plan specific to sort of the downstream area from the West Feeder Canal. And there are management strategies that are outlined um, such as, you know, investigating causes, um, um, potentially changing operations or adding um, additional treatment facilities like dry detention basins, et cetera. Um, so there are some ideas within the adaptive management plan that, that have been put on paper. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll go to our last subsession of the day, and it's actually a panel discussion on the use of indigenous knowledge in the work planning process. And I do recognize, <laughs> excuse me, that we are standing between you all with bathroom breaks and your happy hour. So I promise that we will um, attempt here to be very specific and <laughs> Noel, can you move my sound here? Because they're all on the other end. Sorry. So um, I haven't had a chance to speak with Cindy or Armando about how to specifically address the, the questions here in the bullet points that were provided. Um, but at yes, least Armando. Can, 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 I, can I start off with a, do. a question, please? Um, so uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very broad one. Um, so, and this is up your alley, I think. And that's how has Indigenous knowledge been incorporated in the work planning process? So I'd like to try and address specific examples rather than talking in generalities. And again, I'm going to be speaking from Mikasuki uh, perspectives um, in this case. And I would say that, you know, carrying on with, with a lot of the conversation we just had with water quality, water quality is the priority concern here um, within work, outside of where that water is flowing, of course. But water quality is of particular importance to the Miccosukee tribe because the tribe knows very well what happens to the system when you introduce more nutrients into it. And so I would say here that the fact that the tribe uh, assumed treatment of state under the Clean Water Act um, in order to scientifically establish a 10 parts per billion um, water quality standard on the Alligator Alley Federal Reservation that has been an important component that WERP has had to contend with in order to move forward in the way with planning that it has done so because the project itself cannot impact uh, that 10 parts per billion um, standard within the reservation. And so it has been an important driver as to why the North Feeder STA, for example, is located where it is and to the size that it is, and the manner with which that uh, a lot of the other uh, components here have come together. I'll also note um, that there is an important opportunity here um, where water quality itself is a knowledge gap within the Big Cypress National Preserve and is an area where tribal knowledge is going to directly inform the process that Dr. Geyser and, and, and Kelsey are going to be working toward. I'm very happy to report that the tribe will be meeting with the Park Service and with FIU scientists starting next week in order to start hashing out that monitoring and experimental design plan 
and I want to assure that the tribe's input will be um, sent back uh, by way, or excuse me, the input um, within that technical working capacity is going to be brought back to the tribe for its input to understand that we are not going to be performing this work uh, in places of particular cultural sensitivity, but also that the tribe itself, because the tribe does live within the Big Cypress National Preserve, and the tribe does have its use and occupancy rights within the preserve, the entirety of the preserve, that this is absolutely essentially important work to be undertaken and for which the tribe will be working in a partnering capacity to assist and to contribute. I'll certainly turn it over to Cindy or Armando. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so I'll be brief to you. Um, I will refer to yesterday's meeting. Essentially, that's how we're incorporating work and I mean, indigenous knowledge into work. We're out there listening to the tribe, tribal members, um, trying to bring into the written aspect of a, a planning process. The question is planning, we're planning process. So we're trying to bring that knowledge into the black and white paper, basically. Uh, we're trying to interpret the guidance that has been out from the White House there's no per se policy that we can adhere to, but certainly I think all the agencies have been making a tremendous effort to incorporate that knowledge that is very important. I think uh, a, a staff member from the tribe yesterday kind of brought it up to your attention when we were at the Osceola camp, the human aspect of this whole process. Uh, so that is, that's really what I, Cindy. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. It's good to see you again. Um, so I read an email uh, earlier this week from um, our headquarters that was talking about how they were going to develop an implementation guidance for how to incorporate indigenous knowledge into core projects, which is wonderful. The last I had heard, that wasn't going to take place. Well, now it is. Um, just to make sure before I announce this to you guys on the drive here, I called the ASA's office and I'm like, is this for real? And they're like, yes. So that's good news. Unfortunately, it's not going to get here before, of course, we're finished with, with this feasibility study. Um, nevertheless, um, the tribes are our partners. You know, like Kevin has alluded to or said, they have lived here. They know more about the system than, of course, the scientists in a different way um, that are studying this, this area. So for WARP specifically, I think you asked how we're incorporating IK into WARP. Is that the question? Okay. So... Ugh. <laughs> I'm going to start from the top and I'm going to work down. Or actually, no, no, I'm going to start from the bottom and go up. First of all, um, the try. First of all, let's think about how work came to be in the first place. Work. Um, I know the Miccosukee tribe. I've got documents that the Miccosukee tribe since 2006 or either four have been asking for work. Um, to restore the areas that's important to them. Um, that's what we're doing is, is we're moving forward with that project. In the Southern part of the system, the tribe has consistently said, you need more culverts, you need more culverts. So as part of WARP, we are including culverts into US or Tamiami Trail and Loop Road. Where those exactly will be placed, we don't know that yet. That's in the PED phase. That's in the planning and design phase. Um, that's when we go to the tribes and we go to the, the public that lives out there and we say, hey guys, where are you seeing issues along these two, these two um, roads? Um, that's gonna be incorporating indigenous knowledge, of course, from the tribe on the placement of those. Um, 
regarding the vegetation removal for the S140 area and the L28 terminus of the L28s um, north and, and interceptor. That's on reservation land. Um, together, we have to work as a team to figure out, I mean, it's pretty dense. I'm sure, I think some of y'all have been out there. It's crazy. And you're in the middle of nowhere. We're going to have to use their, they have been traversing this area forever. So we need their input on, hey, you know, how would you go about doing this? Um, what are your ideas for removing this? What needs to be removed? What doesn't need to be removed? Um, McCormick's Landing uh, or McCormick Island, uh, the restoration of that. So that was bisected, if you remember, by the L28I uh, back in the 60s when L28I was constructed. It bisected a culturally significant island. Um, to restore that island, we just can't go in and restore it without their knowledge. Um, <laughs> their information, whether it's plant communities need to be planted at this level, whether, you know, how high is this area going to be? How is it going to grade down? Um, anything and everything you can imagine, what type of soil? Um, that indigenous, but again, that's in the planning and design phase, right? As well as construction. This is going to roll over through the entire extent of the project. Um, Plugging the canals. Um, we're working closely with with them. All the tribes, both tribes, are on the eco sub teams. Um, their knowledge is invaluable with regards to how high these plugs need to be. Uh, for like Stephen phased and alluded to during high water events, for the animals to go and and find refuge, and also have some deep water areas within the canal so leave it open so that during dry season these animals can have you know water um access the gate of culverts and seminal um indigenous knowledge is going to be incorporated in the operation of those um I don't know. Am I missing anything? Um, I can go on. Oh, I, th I think. Thank you, Cindy. That was good. Um, maybe I'll take a question from the panel. Um, Helen, go ahead. Hi there, Helen Regan, University of California, Riverside. Um, we've heard a little bit about adaptive management, and I was just wondering um, how or if indigenous knowledge is being incorporated in a formal or informal way into adaptive management plans or, or the involvement of um, the tribes? Hi, Helen. Um, I'll try and answer that question. Um, so adaptive management is not officially a component of WERP as an Army Corps project in the sense that, for example, BBC is, uh, it is kind of an ad hoc component as I see it. Um, but to the larger point here, you heard a little bit about some of the constraints that we have with process of what an authorized project is going to look like and what a water control plan is going to look like. And to what degree we can make changes to that and quite the lengthy and involved process with NEPA, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make changes. And that's what I'm hoping to um, continue to assert here is that an adaptive management plan um, cannot be as rigid as the process by which it is seeking to inject that flexibility into. And so, um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question properly, but I would have to say that uh, in terms of indigenous knowledge being interjected into that adaptive management plan, the Miccosukee tribe will continue to use its communication 
platforms um, and its opportunities in the govern government to government relationship that it has with the federal government and the strong partnering relationship that it has with the South Florida Water Management District to address matters as they might be coming up so that we can work towards solutions. Um, solutions, again, that I'd suggest we have a chance to work a little outside of the box with, and that makes a lot of people uneasy when you're talking about experimenting with water operations, for example. Well, I'm going to argue again that, that the tribe is not seeking to do something here that is outside of what they know to be true, to be true of the system. The tribe doesn't have a financial dog in the restoration fight, so to speak. The tribe wants the land to be healed. The tribe wants the land to work in the way that generations of knowledge have passed down through um, the members of the tribe as a matter of life and death, not as a matter of academic pursuit, not as a matter to make and break careers, but because they live on the land, they protect the land, and the land has protected them. So I would hope that adaptive management has enough latitude for those discussions as we move down the road that are not going to be rigid, that are not going to be based on constraints, but more based on opportunities for realizing true restoration in a healing sense that is from the top of the watershed down to the bottom. I have a follow-up on that. I don't know if Melissa Nasudi is still on the line. Um, do you see her? Melissa, is there anything, I don't want to put you on the spot either, but I don't want to misspeak. Um, but whenever I first got here, do you want to add anything um, with regards to the Seminole and our experience um, and the input that they have provided? Well, I, I don't really want to speak for either tribe because I don't think that's my place. Um, but oh, I, not I, I have. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I will say that um, we developed the adaptive management ecological monitoring within the eco sub team and tried to include both tribes um, with, within that form as well as present components of the um, adaptive management and ecological monitoring plan at government to government um, consultation meetings. Um, with respect to IK, I think of it as largely coming in through those operations of the culverts on the western boundary. Uh, the, the Big Cypress Reservation. I think that's mentioned within the adaptive management plan specifically. Um, but we did give the, the tribe opportunity to comment on the development of the, the plan itself. But, but that's all I, I, I can say sort of at this point. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Well, I have a few scripted ones. Um, so, okay, go ahead, Dave. Well, I don't know. Your your uh, your questions may be better, but no, no. I, I guess I'm just I'm I'm pausing. And I was biting my lip, Cindy, a bit because um, you well, Kevin mentioned the need for flexibility, the long term knowledge, the generations of knowledge that the tribe brings to the information base. The, the knowledge that they have. It may not be scientific knowledge, but it is social, cultural knowledge that right. is important. I'll and address just, that separately. Yeah, separate the red contact with the environment. Basically. Right. I mean, they live there and they've seen the flexibility and the variability and all that goes into that. And I'm just wondering, and I'm, there may not be an answer to this, but as we start to frame a future after SERP and after these projects get implemented, and we know that there's going to be changes coming because of climate and hydrology and so on and so forth. In your estimation, do we have the right structure to embrace the, the, the long and more expansive, perhaps, knowledge outside of academic scientific knowledge? Do we have the right structure in place to help make sure we incorporate 
the tribal concerns? Absolutely not. Okay. That, that in my opinion, um, this is new to the core, right? Um, yeah. It is is new to a lot of people in Western science, right? Um, together, we have to approach this with the tribes um, hand in hand and figure out how, like I was just dotting, making notes whenever Melissa was speaking, you know, ecological benefits. How, does, do, how do I take that to the tribe and be like, can you assign a number to the ecological benefits from an indigenous knowledge standpoint? Take, you know, take it to your council, tribal council or elders, and how would you rate this feature or how would you rate this alternative on a scale of one to a hundred? We don't even have that yet. So these discussions needs, you know, they need to happen. We And we're going to have to build it from the ground up. And are we going to get it right the first time? No. So then my question is, are you starting to look at how you might develop those structures? Absolutely. I am. Okay. Um, I do have a book at home. It's not this book particularly, but I wrote, I have to transfer this over. Um, my biggest concern with, with the whole concept of indigenous knowledge and developing how to incorporate it into projects is I don't want to go overstep and do something that, or interpret something that, that maybe the tribes are not okay with, right? So right now, I'm sure the tribes, I don't want to speak for them, but the tribes are probably thinking about how they're going to, you know, incorporate in, or how they're going to present indigenous knowledge to agencies, just like we are sitting here trying to figure out how do we ask, how do we keep it confidential? What are our legal, you know, yeah. So it's going to take time. May I? Um, first off, um, <clears throat> tribal knowledge is inherently um, unique in the way that it is imparted both within the tribe from the knowledge holders to those of us who work in the public, mostly in the public space here. Um, with how to bring that forward. Um, and there is a tremendous amount of information that is not shared with us and should never be counted on and being shared in, in general. However, the Miccosukee tribe acknowledges that um, in order to achieve the benefits and the successes of Everglades restoration, not just work, um, that the tribe's knowledge needs to get out there in a way that is meaningful and in a way that um, it can be speaking to its audience in the proper way. And the audience, or the consumers of information, for the most part, are Western trained scientists. I sure hope I can consider myself one of them as well. And so in this case, <clears throat> um, the tribe recognizes and, and has taken the steps um, as it has done many times in the past, to bring itself to a level um, in order to have good conversation uh, in a way that is not conventional for the tribe in terms of peer-reviewed papers and um, numerical data that is, you know, has a, a particular experimental design and statistical robustness to um, have these conversations in a very technical data-driven manner. However, that doesn't mean that we can't follow a process in order to present that information and do so in a scientific manner. I would argue, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to state very clearly that the tribe does conduct science, it has done so for many years. And again, the knowledge that comes from that Western science, I and my team have the express um, need to synthesize 
those numbers with the proper cultural context in a way that comes forward um, and can be treated on a level of parity with the volumes of papers and textbooks that have been published about how the Everglades works, how the Everglades used to work, and to what degree we can proceed in a way and select for a system to perform in a certain way that's going to be somewhere between that, between how it used to work and how it works today. Where are we going to land in between? Um, there is a process that Edward has a paper in the UM Law Review Press um, that is outlining the manner by which um, the Miccosukee tribe is seeking to take a leadership role in how to do peer-reviewed publication of indigenous knowledge. And I did have a conversation about that in part with Helen yesterday out, out at the um, um, Shark Valley Tower. And I was very pleased to hear that Helen had reviewed um, the S12AB letter that was published uh, and presented from the tribe earlier this year. And she's also read the, the draft paper that Edward is going to have published here this coming spring. And within that, I'm just going to state very quickly that the process by which the Miccosukee tribe is going to bring forward its Western science synthesized with indigenous knowledge is a process that mirrors the current science process by which peer review publication is made. The knowledge holders, the data gatherers present their information. In this case, we are getting that information from the knowledge holders within the community. That information is compiled and properly exerted so that we are retaining what needs to be retained within the tribe and that we have the proper information to make the point and answer the question or ask the question, so to speak, um, for whatever that pertinent subject matter is. That information from the tribal members is then vetted within the tribe's science um, technical team and where we are able to add to that um, in order to bring that level of that Western-based science into this. That whole package goes back to the knowledge holders that provided the oral histories or the indigenous knowledge for a internal vetting amongst that combined group. And once we reach a consensus on what that message is going to be, it goes to the business council and is signed off by the chairman. At that point, fully citable, fully referenced within that particular uh, paper, that is now presented as indigenous knowledge for full public consumption, for full citability, and again, is an internally vetted, peer-reviewed process of taking knowledge and bringing that forward so that there can be a level of trust and credibility ascribed to that. Um, that is the way that we're seeking to move forward to provide Indigenous knowledge outside of you listening to me or, uh, or some other member of my team, and for which you might not necessarily get the opportunity to hear directly from the mouths of the tribal members who are the knowledge holders. If you related to this, one of the main, you know, kind of canned questions here was what are successes and challenges to indigenous knowledge? I'd like to just point out here, um, first off, a success is that WERP in and of itself is still continuing to move forward. And I would say that WERP is moving forward specifically due to the Miccosukee and Seminole tribe, um, making sure that we cut through the rhetoric and we cut through um, the fear and the uncertainty that has surrounded this project for many years to continue to move it forward. Um, that's a, one comment, but really more going back to this, what are the challenges? Well, in incorporating an indigenous knowledge, unfortunately, we've experienced um, outright dismissal of information um, that, uh, or, or denying 
of, of some of that information that we've put forward because it contradicts some of the information that has been readily resourced or, or sourced and, and referenced here over the last 20 or so years about, well, how was the system before drainage? Um, that's a problem. And that's, quite frankly, a bit of an insult for the tribal members who are the knowledge holders who provide that. Two examples are um, water levels within the greater Everglades and the Big Cypress, and the fact that um, there's been some reluctance to, to accept the fact that these areas do dry down, not every year, but they do dry down. And that you heard a little bit about that uh, referenced in, in Edward's um, comment this morning. That's very counter to a lot of the plans that are moving forward here with some components of Everglades restoration projects that seek to increase water levels and prevent dry downs. Again, variability within the system, um, stress in the system are important drivers of system productivity. I'll stop there. Um, the other component that I'd point out as being a key issue of dismissal of information by the tribe is over the presence of larger animals within the landscape. Uh, the presence of mesoprey, such as deer, and their frequency and distribution in numbers across the landscape. The use of predators within the landscape, within tree island systems. Um, there are those who have contended that Large animals were really not a component of the Everglades, and even some of the smaller animals were not important components in that they were only on tree islands during the dry season, um, or et cetera, et cetera, whatever you want to say. That is wholly um, inaccurate uh, for the knowledge that was put forward by the tribe. So there are some key things here that, that illustrate a need for continued conversation, and for us, Again, the Miccosukee tribe realizes that it is one voice amongst many. And so the tribe is trying its best to meet that challenge on how to best communicate with its audience. And so pursuing a pathway uh, and a method that is akin to most of the folks here in this room and how they approach their jobs every single day. Um, I appreciate the examples. Um, I think we have a question from Marla online, and then we'll go to you, Casey. Thank you. Um, hi, Cindy, Kevin, and Armando. Great to see you, and greetings from Switzerland. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for, <clears throat> Kevin, responding to that question about challenges and ways going forward. I wonder if I could pose the same question to Armando and to Cindy uh, in terms of working with indigenous knowledge within the district and within the core. Um, what challenges uh, do you face and what strategies do you see going forward that might be useful? Thank you. Specific to work uh, would be really helpful. Well, I, I will put it back to the original question about the process. I mean, we, we're still, it is a new thing and it's described as we're, we're at the infancy basically of trying to develop that process. Um, the district is eager to get that information so it can be incorporated into the planning process. Uh, we're happy to hear that there is a report coming out uh, we're we're waiting for that because it, it's essentially that it's how do we process this information that uh, it's been there for many years, millenniums, basically, and uh, put it into this Western based way of science, basically. Uh, but no, the district is very open and eager to get engaged and has always been engaged with the tribe both both tribes um and very open to get into the table to have this discussion so before um before 
I don't know if it was right before the White House came out with their memo or right after. I don't know if, sorry, can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if this was right before uh, the memo from the White House came out or um, I think it was right after the memo came out. Um, we were trying to figure out how do we calculate um, benefits sorry, I'm not a biologist, um, ecological or ecosystem benefits um, in the native area, the Seminole native area. Um, if the gates are closed, if the gated culverts are closed or open or what have you. And we had no, you know, again, we had no way to even wrap our head around how to do that, but we knew we needed something. So the only thing we could figure is to have the tribe write a letter, which is in the draft EIS, or it should be, um, saying what ecological benefits from the tribe's perspective there would be um, with them operating, you know, within that area. Hoping that it would go, you know, past muster with, with our headquarters and our reviewers as it, as it goes up the chain. The vertical chain. Um, that so that is a challenge which I've already alluded to. Um, regarding warp um, monitoring, um, I think I think I've already alluded to, or spoke to this before, but a contracting vehicle or some way that we can do a CA, a cooperating uh, agreement with a tribe you know, for their reservation, if we need to do monitoring as part of work, right, um, on the tribe's reservation, why can't we do a CA with them and pay them directly um, to do that monitoring on their reservation as part of the project? Um, whether it's, you know, bugs and bunnies, water, what have you. Um, I think that's a challenge um, I'm, because they have the knowledge, the knowledge to do that. Right, more so than the the scientists. No offense, but um, that are normally doing it. Um, I I can't think of anything else right now. Yeah, I, I think it's important to to realize that it, you know I had a whole bunch of notes, but uh, you know Western science and IK are complement. We need to start thinking that it is a complementary, not oh it is yeah you know may or shape. I agree, form, but even SERP right now that a lot of the projects are heading into operations, there's still plenty of projects where we can really do implement that indigenous knowledge. Be partners on this. I mean, the reality is at the end of the day is nat nature and the environment, <laughs> whether it's uh, tribal members or regular people, it's, it's nature, the wonder world. And one thing I want to point out, not only, you know, during the design phase, but also even construction, because if you remember correctly, you know, the Tamiami Trail, that was a feat. That was an engineering feat to go across that expanse, right, with the type of equipment that they had. The Miccosukee and the Seminole were guides and assisted them. And led, the that, led all that... Um all of that surveying by foot when the ground was dry. So I have pictures of it. There are pictures in the museum. Armando's got a picture on his phone right now of that. So their knowledge, um, they've always been there. Their knowledge can assist with us even in the construction of, of these features. It, Serp, warp, whatever. Okay, Casey. This has been a great panel. Thank you so much, especially at this time of day. I just I really appreciate um, all the, the great thoughts that are coming from it that you're sharing. Um, my favorite definition of science is from the physicist Freeman Dyson, who describes science as the practice of proving the experts wrong. 
And what I think is interesting about that is science is inherently disrespectful to elders in some sense and to what's come before you. And, you know, junior faculty, what they need to do is prove that the senior faculty in their field are wrong, right? And that they're better. And that's why we have tenure. So when they do, we still get, get to keep our jobs. Um, but it's, it seems conflicting in some sense with, uh, with indigenous knowledge. Um, it's, just a, it's just a fact, I think, or it's something to, to deal with, I guess. It's a very different, I think, approach. Um, but this question of how to incorporate into projects, um, Helen's question regarding adaptive management, it seems like the obvious place in some sense where I hear about indigenous knowledge as sort of this historical body of knowledge, but it's also probably the best available knowledge of the present and how it's changing as well. And so it seems as though it could be such a valuable piece of not just monitoring, not monitoring the performance metrics we need monitored because they're parts of the plan, but just everything that's happening in a way that's not necessarily easily quantified. And so it's, it's not a question, just a statement sort of, it's, you know, finding a way to incorporate that into our understanding of whether projects are successful or not. Um, and not, and, and everyone else who's living there as well and firsthand experiencing what's going on, right? A way to incorporate that qualitative knowledge or different kind of knowledge into our evaluation projects would seem useful. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can add a little bit because uh, through my through my career of, of being the liaison, um, the biggest thing that I have learned is there's a different way to listen. Uh, I have had privileges to to listen to elders, and there's not an agenda like we're accustomed. Okay, you go to a meeting and there's an agenda, and then there's directly a point of a question. Uh, the question may be there, but it's a story. And at the beginning, I was very confused because it will start in a, with a story of some sort that, but if you really were willing to listen, it will come around at the end of the story of what, but it wasn't within the context of how they realized and understood nature or environment. And it's not only here, it, happens i'm originally from south america a lot of the amazon tribes are the same way they they there's this disparity when you sit down in front because you know like, like they're so the approach to to everyday life is so different even the science what they have how they treat people uh, if they are sick is so different from what, what we're so accustomed to and it's just how open we are to accept it or to listen. And to go on what Armando was saying, so whenever I was on the um, Everglades study with the Miccosukee um, this past fall, um, and I'm on an island and one of the airboat drivers is, is Miccosukee and um, Johnny Tiger, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and he um, made a comment about, he's like, wasn't there a... Um, satin wood or satin leaf tree on you know the island we were on and um one of the other members was like yeah, yeah i think so and they couldn't find it anymore and they're like and i'm like i'm like what other you know tree or what other islands do you not see that specific tree and they they talked about the importance the cultural importance historically to the tribe that that tree was the wood it was like ironwood right um, to make bows and arrows um, and things with. So, and I'm like, huh, I need to take this back, of course, because maybe that's an indicator species because maybe, you know, the feet are getting too wet for too long periods of time. I mean, that's indigenous knowledge um, that can be passed along. So like Armando was saying, the stories, I mean, if you just learn to listen, um, as a scientist, you might can pick up more um, on some of these things that can lead you or us as Western scientists in the right or agencies in the right direction. But now how do we convince our leaders? You know, that's the other thing. It is, you know, Casey, um, 
understanding the cutthroat nature of academia and um, realizing that I, I certainly want to acknowledge that's how it happens in some places in some ways. Indigenous knowledge is not deferential to, to elders and the knowledge that they have per se. Indigenous knowledge is embraced as a collective conglomeration of all lived experiences. And that includes that of what people are experiencing today, whether you're a child, an adult, or an elder. And the difference between how indigenous knowledge is passed along and which I would argue is maybe the true nature of what an iterative scientific process should be is that it adds rather than tries to detract and debunk. And so um, that knowledge gets passed on and gets added to, not necessarily for the purpose of trying to make other things fall away or to disprove. These are people, again, who are living on the land and who are making their living on the land. And it is all in their collective interest to share knowledge and grow knowledge together, not to withhold it, not to manipulate it for a particular purpose. Um, I don't know if, have to, if I'm answering any questions that you may have had, but I'm making a comment in that, uh, I'm making this comment for the express purpose of talking to where I think the value of indigenous knowledge comes in it, from a different perspective that I think a lot of Western-based academic knowledge is coming from. You know, we can read papers from 20 or 30 years ago, and it's, it's gone. Well, okay. Um, this is a short window of, of time that we're talking about in those 20 to 30 years. When you're talking indigenous knowledge and sorting through this for thousands of years, yeah, maybe that makes a difference. But I think also what drives it makes the difference. And I will also, I just want to say here, and I know you guys are looking for us to get done, but, you know, how to incorporate indigenous knowledge across the board. Yeah, I'm going to, there's, there's no roadmap to this right now. There's no guiding principle to a federal agency or a state agency and how to do this. And quite frankly, there isn't a, a wish list of how to do this for most of the tribes. The, you know, the whole notion of sharing knowledge from the Miccosukee tribe is something new for them as well. So we have to be committed, though, to listening and to talking to each other and to not be doing so for the purpose of saying, you're wrong and I'm right or whatever the case would be. If the knowledge is being shared, it's being shared for a reason and that there is a truth to it. I think it's our challenge collectively, those of us working in the room, those of us who are listening on the phone, um, those of the very well-intentioned thousands of people who are working toward Everglades restoration and working toward work, the landowners who are involved in this as every bit uh, as much as the tribes or the agencies are. We have to be talking and we have to be listening. That sounds really pie in the sky, great touchy feel ideal, but it's harder to do. You got to open your minds and you got to open your hearts and we've got to inject our ability to be flexible and to be able to move and change based on the conditions, based on the information we have and not to be rigid. Okay. That's a good place to end. Thank you, panel. Uh, Armando, Kevin, and Cindy, and thanks for all the other participants today. Um, so we'll adjourn.